Good afternoon and welcome to everybody. I hope that you had a great lunch uh, break and everybody's looking forward to the next um, session uh, of this conference as much as I do. So welcome everybody to all the speakers um, and uh, all the audience that joined. Um, my name is Anna Badurska. I am a European program lead uh, with Cap Digital and I am delighted to host this uh, afternoon session. Let me just take you through the agenda of the points we uh, proposed, we uh, prepared to you. So uh, in the next part, uh, we are going to hear from uh, seven winning DAPSI projects. So the um, entrepreneurs that are uh, working hard to implement the um, um, use cases and the uh, applications uh, and solutions uh, in uh, data portability uh, that were treated from the uh, very high level in the uh, morning session. This um, session will be uh, moderated by my colleague, uh, Miguel uh, Gonzalez. And just after that, we uh, will uh, move uh, on to uh, two exciting round tables with uh, the first one looking closer at the user experience and uh, adoption. Uh, of the solutions uh, uh, moderated by Michelle de Jong from um, Founder Source. And in the last uh, part, uh, we will uh, have a chance to uh, discuss more in depth the technology transfer and uh, scaling up issues together with my uh, colleague uh, uh, Bertrand Lejeune from Cap Digital and also um, the um, innovators, the teams uh, from the DAPSI project. So please stay for, uh, tuned for that. Uh, as in the morning panel, uh, there will be an opportunity to ask questions from the audience. So we are very much looking forward to uh, the um, active participation uh, from, the, um, from the conference audience. And uh, before uh, getting to this exciting part, I would like to use this opportunity to just uh, have a brief look on, again, on uh, what is the DAPSI program about. We have uh, mentioned it briefly this morning uh, with uh, Olivier uh, Branger from the European Commission. Uh, so just uh, please note that uh, DAPSI program is a framework uh, within the NGI initiative that is um, with the objective, which objective is to foster uh, advanced research uh, in the data portability and uh, services field. And how is it done? It's through, uh, through support uh, that we um, provide to researchers, uh, SMEs, uh, startups, and uh, innovators um, by providing uh, equity funding, and, uh, sorry, equity um, free funding, and uh, also a pack of services, uh, may that be uh, coaching, uh, mentoring, or uh, any other uh, types of uh, support in the uh, areas needed or that's fit best to uh, help those entrepreneurs uh, on their way to, to market, uh, to reach the market and to, to bring their uh, use cases to contribute to um, internet uh, community. Um, this project is well advanced. It, uh, it started already end of 2019, but in any case, it is not yet finished. It will uh, go on um, into, um, uh, until late uh, uh, 2022. So there are still opportunities to come. And uh, just to mention, um, it's a project uh, of uh, almost 7 million euro that the European uh, Commission is uh, uh, sponsoring. And also as already uh, Olivier uh, mentioned this morning, 80% of these uh, funds gets directly uh, to the innovators, to the entrepreneurs. It is led by six uh, uh, European uh, partners from uh, five, countries uh, with uh, Zabala Innovation Consulting, uh, the coordinator of DAPSI, uh, Fraunhofer, a leading research um, applied um, institute uh, from um, Germany, uh, F6S, uh, biggest community of um, uh, tech funders, um, IMT Starter, um, education and research uh, organization uh, from Paris linked to Institut uh, Min Telecom, a, a school in uh, Paris. Uh, engineering, a global um, uh, software integrator from uh, based in Rome. 
and um, Cap Digital that I don't have to present you, um, I think, after the morning session, and that is the, the host uh, of the conference uh, today. And having said that, I just would like to um, invite uh, everybody to keep in touch and to stay tuned for more opportunities to connect with us uh, through um, social media or uh, just reach out uh, uh, on the email because um, there will be uh, more founding opportunities from DAPSI coming this fall uh, with the third open call. So there is still a chance of um, um, maybe one of you uh, getting um, uh, into the program itself. And uh, I don't want to stop you uh, any further from uh, getting to the very, very exciting part. Uh, that is the uh, DAPSI um, uh, final event and the presentations of the uh, innovators. And I have a great pleasure to hand it over to my colleague, Miguel uh, Gonzalez, who will be um, hosting you and moderating this part of the uh, afternoon. Thank you very much and back to you. Miguel. Thank you, Anna. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, everyone. So yes, I'm Miguel Gonçalves from App Success. I'm responsible for dissemination and communication activities for the data portability and services incubator, uh, also called DAPSI. So uh, we had a very successful uh, first open call with more than 182 projects submitted. And what you will see next are the seven projects finalizing the first edition of the DAPSI supporting program. Uh, let me just share one thing before uh, going straight to the presentation. It's kind of a consensus uh, that there won't be only one perfect and agnostic solution uh, available tomorrow to address the data portability cha challenges. And that's the beauty of the project funded under the NGI DAPSI program. As you will see, they all have their own backgrounds, points of view, um, different approaches to uh, solve these challenges. Uh, and you will see uh, this in the presentation. So let's start with the first project called DEEP, uh, which will be presented by Philip Page. Uh, Philip, with the aim of reviving the universal collaborative aspect of the web, Philip is co-founder of the Human Colossus Foundation. So Philip will be presenting in French, and uh, this virtual floor is yours for 10 minutes. Merci, Miguel. Notre vision est un Internet de plateforme décentralisée où les humains sont les nœuds d'interopérabilité pour des échanges de données fluides et sécurisés. Pour ce faire, nous construisons les composantes de base pour permettre aux individus, aux organisations et aux agences gouvernementales de contrôler l'authenticité, le consentement, la sémantique et la légitimité des interactions. Je suis Philippe Page, membre de l'équipe Digital Immunization Passport, et vous présenter en moins de 10 minutes le travail que nous avons fait euh, sur le, le cas d'école des vaccins de la fièvre jaune. Euh, nous allons vous présenter le, une brève démonstration et le suivi de ce projet. Donc, quel est le problème avec le passeport vaccinal de la fièvre jaune, un passeport qui existe sous forme physique depuis très longtemps et que la plupart des voyageurs ont déjà utilisé souvent. On ne se rend pas souvent compte des trois éléments qui sont importants derrière ce petit document de base. Il y a une sorte de, de vérité de validité scientifique. On connaît la, les effets de la vaccination. Derrière, il y a une certaine légitimité à travers les, les, les accords internationaux qui ont été faits par l'OMS. Et surtout, très important pour l'adoption, le, le, l'authenticité de ce passeport qui est sous le contrôle de l'utilisateur. Alors, pourquoi n'a-t-il jamais été euh, proprement digitalisé ou numérisé depuis de plusieurs années ben, C'est simple, si ça se fait à travers une plateforme unique, il est très difficile de décentraliser l'authentification, la sémantique et la gouvernance et de respecter à la fois le, la diversité des contextes humains. Donc, dans ce cadre d'école, la, la centralisation est un des problèmes. Il faut la regarder du point de vue économique, où les dimensions du business qui nécessitent l'interopérabilité et l'interconnectivité, les dimensions juridiques, nous sommes dans un cadre de multi-juridiction, et évidemment, avec tous les abus qu'il y a eu ces dernières années, il y a un problème de société où les utilisateurs veulent assurer la sphère privée et le consentement. Donc, c'est très difficile d'implémenter ça dans une, sous une forme d'une plateforme centralisée. L'équipe qui s'est intéressée à ce problème est 
c'est une association à but non lucratif en Autriche, Own Your Data, qui est, euh, qui, a, qui est à la source de certaines innovations telles que les Semantic Containers et dont la mission est de, se, de préserver la souveraineté sur nos données. Elle s'est associée dans ce projet à la fondation Human Colossus basée en Suisse et notre mission est la, la construction de composantes open source pour ce que nous appelons une, une, une dynamic data economy, une économie dynamique des données facilitant les échanges et le partage. Nous travaillons dans un domaine totalement d'open source, uh, Hyperledger, On Your Data est un, un My Data Operator et nous travaillons aussi principalement avec des open standards tels que W3C. Ce projet a été soutenu par la Suisse uh, Tropical Health Institute et uh, les milieux de protection des données en Suisse à travers DPO Associates. Très brièvement, nous allons vous démontrer ce que nous appelons le human centricity dans un, un, dans un transport de données. L'humain au centre est équipé de son, de son assistant digital qui a été construit par uh, Human Colossus Foundation. Les organisations de leur côté ont des semantic containers qui proviennent de On Your Data. Tout organise, deux organisations différentes construisent deux composantes différentes et l'identité sera multiple. En janvier, pour les gens qui étaient déjà là lors de la première présentation, nous avions présenté la fièvre jaune. Cette, cette fois-ci, nous allons vous présenter un autre vaccin qui nécessite un booster shot. Here is a short demo highlighting key features developed in the NGI DAPSI Digital Immunization Passport Project. To cover all data portability aspects of an electronic vaccination record, we created three data flows to demonstrate solutions for specific administrative and technical challenges. We demonstrate creating a verifiable credential for the booster shot of a tick-borne encephalitis vaccination for the first data flow. From a user perspective, the process starts by establishing a secure connection with the clinic and the software checking compliance with the clinic's usage policies for sharing data. Following the initial data capture, including information about a previous vaccination, the user sends the vaccination request to the clinic via an, an encrypted channel. The clinic receives the user's vaccination request, automatically validates the input and performs an additional identity check. Verifiers can perform this additional authentication step by checking a traditional paper-based identification document, such as a driver's license, or an IDAS conformant digital signature. Courtesy of an iris scanner supplied by iRespond, the implementation also demonstrates the use of a biometric ID as an authentic route of trust. With all information available and verified, a clinician performs the vaccination and creates a verifiable credential. In this implementation, the personal data store of the user and the semantic container of the vaccination clinic store the vaccination request and verifiable credential. These locations house machine-readable usage policies to dictate data usage terms secured cryptographically. For the second data flow, we demonstrate the verification of a credential at a checkpoint. The user initiates the process by scanning a QR code supplied by the checkpoint. The user receives a request to provide evidence of vaccination status and the usage policies that describe data handling at the checkpoint. If acceptable to the user and with a compliant verifiable credential available, the user submits a verifiable presentation. The officer performs an identity check, either paper-based via a digital signature or through a biometric ID. The validity of the verifiable presentation is assessed and automatically documented. The officer makes a final decision to admit or decline entry, and the user receives a dedicated verifiable credential documenting the process. According to agreed upon usage policies, both the user and checkpoint have contained access to the data exchange audit trail, all cryptographically secured. We demonstrate secure and traceable data sharing between an individual and an organization in the third data flow. On the organization side, the infrastructure utilizes a semantic container to store a survey and an associated usage policy and a participant list. Each participant receives an email containing a link to access a data sharing plugin for the personal data store where they can review detailed information regarding the survey. Each user then fills out the survey and selects some accompanying data. When the data is shared, a unique digital watermark enables unambiguous identification throughout the data lifecycle. The organization manages all survey responses in the semantic container and can automatically process GDPR information requests or requests from the user to revoke previous consent instances.
here's, here's a short demo. Mais les certificats digitaux ne sont qu'une chose, et l'immunisation va beaucoup plus loin. Et en fait, il faut parler plutôt de portabilité des données médicales dans son ensemble. Même si le marché des vaccins est énorme, ce n'est pas ce marché-là que nous allons regarder. Et dans ce, cet aspect-là, le, le, le COVID la pandémie COVID-19 nous a donné un, une sorte de wake-up call en montrant à quel point ce n'était pas seulement la technologie, mais l'utilisation de ces passeports vaccinaux qui étaient compliqués. Notre premier marché va être en fait les producteurs de vaccins, les organisations de santé qui, doivent, qui ont des processus très compliqués d'échange de données ou de partage de données. Et on veut faire ceci, nous faisons ceci dans un cadre qui préserve donc le respect de la sphère privée des individus. Donc finalement, notre marché est plutôt la certification digitale en ligne avec la décentralisation et le partage de données tel que prévu par les stratégies européennes. Et nous, produis, nous, allons, nous avançons selon deux, deux axes. Le premier axe, ce sont à travers notre fondation et l'association Onio Data, du point de vue non lucratif, où nous développons les standards euh, génériques et ce qu'on appelle les foundational services. Nous sommes financés par différentes subventions et euh, quelques donations. Mais nous allons aussi mettre sur pied certains services qui permettent à, ces, ces, à nos associations de, de survivre de manière euh, euh, pérenne en fournissant quelques services de base qui doivent être disponibles à l'entier de l'écosystème. Si l'on joint le travail fait à DAPSI avec d'autres travaux faits par Onio Data et Human Colossus, nous sommes dans une situation aujourd'hui où nous avons plus, plusieurs proof of concept qui nous ont été demandés dans différentes solutions, toujours généralement dans les milieux médicaux ou dans des, des milieux qui nécessitent un partage de données à grande échelle. Donc, nous, avons, nous sommes en train de, lancer une, de, de former une compagnie privée qui permet de finalement traiter certains projets euh, du point de vue commercial. Euh, nos premiers, notre pipeline est dans la, la, la logistique des vaccins, pas seulement dans la certification, et dans le portage des données médicales. Nous formons un consortium qui devrait produire, euh, sous forme de software as a service, des solutions déjà d'ici 2022, basées sur les proof of concept que nous sommes en train de mettre sur pied. Merci de votre attention. Thank you very much, Philip. Thank you uh, for uh, respecting the 10 minutes and for the demo and all the presentation. Thank you very much. So let's proceed with the next project uh, called DPL. And I have the pleasure to introduce Alejandro Russo, uh, professor in information security at Chalmers Gothenburg University and CEO of DPL. The virtual floor is yours. All right. Thank you very much, Miguel. Are you seeing the screen, right? Yeah, perfect. Okay, excellent. Yeah, so uh, yeah, we are Dipella, a company created to unleash the power of analytics. So if you want to summarize Dipella in one sentence, it's a deep tech startup that performs analytics on personal data while respecting the privacy of individuals, which will help your company to comply with some of the GDPR requirements. And one of the analytics that we can do is like, for example, asking, you know, how many people in your workplace have certain disease without pointing fingers to anyone. The goal that we have is to um, identify trends in human behavior and learning from that. Why? Because you know that will help us, us to take data-driven decisions. We might, might as well share those analytics with someone else. Or even, you know, we are collecting data and it's super expensive for us. You can think about uh, monetizing uh, the data that you have. Right? In any of these three purposes, we, we kind of help you out. And the challenge, of course, is to do all of that without violating the privacy of your customers or your citizens. Right? So more graphically, what we enable is cooperation around data. You want to have many companies or governments or entities that they want to cooperate around data, then you need the data to flow, but without violating the privacy of the citizens or your customers. Or you can as well use it to share it internally. To be more concrete, for example, uh, since the previous talk was about medical um, vaccination, here we choose a similar scenario, but we want to learn about the trends of uh, effectiveness of a medical treatment, for example, some treatment for COVID-19. Or we might want to learn about the trends, uh, about um, side effects on certain medical treatments or vaccines, again, with the COVID-19, right? So, um, 
Right, so you will collect a lot of data and it gets a point where you want to process it and kind of learn about these trends. To be more concrete and to see what are the problems about privacy that we can deal with, we can ask the question like how effective is a medical treatment on patients which are in their 40s, they are male, and it has an associated heart disease. If I publish this result, nobody will get nervous about the privacy being violated. But what about if I ask the addition restriction that, and those people need to live in the Nordic countries. And on top of that, I ask that, you know, it's people that regularly consume Viagra. And on top of that, that they have an EU passport. And on top of that, that they live in Gothenburg uh, in Sweden. I will argue that people might feel comfortable about publishing the, the first number, the number corresponding to the question number one. But the question number five, that's a little bit more sensitive because it's kind of, people might be a little bit uncomfortable because um, you know there are many constraints that you need to fulfill and the more constraints you have, you, more, you can narrow more individuals. What about if I can tell you, you can answer all of them without worrying about violating the privacy. So yeah, before we, I show you how we do it, let me remove some of the misconceptions that industry has right now, which is about data anonymization. People believe that you know, if you have a data set with some personal identifiers, and if you remove those identifiers or replace it by random numbers, you can release the data and the people is super safe and the privacy is preserved. Unfortunately, this doesn't work at all. And the reason for that is like all the columns that you have in your data set has a strong correlations with who the individual is. So uh, even though you remove some of the inter uh, identifiers, you might still be able to identify the individuals in the study. Instead, we use the technique of differential privacy, which is a, a technique which has mathematically proven that works for ensuring the privacy of individuals. And that's why we created this company based on this technology to unleash the power of analytics on personal data. So this is who we are. So we are uh, two professors in computer science. Uh, my uh, colleague, Marco Gavardi, which is one of the world leaders in data privacy, in this technique known as differential privacy, is at Boston University. Myself, I'm at Chalmers University and Gothenburg University uh, in Gothenburg in Sweden. And I have more than 10 years of experience in building secure system. And we have our business developer, Carola, who uh, has a lot of experience in building uh, software companies in a B2B model like we have. And of course, we, we are the faces, but you know, behind we have a development team working and uh, developing our product. Right, so uh, yeah. So now I will tell you a little bit what we, how, how, how we work, how we apply differential privacy and what it is. And I will explain you slightly what our novelty is. So differential privacy essentially takes the results of the analytics you want to do uh, on your customers or citizens and change the result of the analytics with some random noise in a careful way, right? In order to protect the privacy of individuals. And of course, because you inject random noise, uh, you are losing a little bit of precision of accuracy of your analysis. So if you care a lot about privacy, you need to inject a lot of noise, but then the accuracy of the analytics in the end is not that great. On the other hand, if you care a lot about accuracy, you need to inject almost no noise, which is not good for privacy. So there is a trade-off between privacy and accuracy. And to find the right balance is quite tricky. And that's what our novelty is. And that's what we kind of uh, help out. So the way that we see that Dipella can be deployed uh, is like a thin middleware in, a, in the database layer with a little bit of exposure to the data analysts in order to tune the amount of noise that uh, needs to be injected to protect privacy. And yeah, we have developed um, a backend that does all this uh, reason about uh, uh, privacy versus accuracy. We provide a user interface to help you out to tune according to what you need and the analytics that you are doing. And uh, yeah, and we identify different management roles of the data, uh, depending if you own the data or you want to just uh, do analytics on the data. Our solution can be deployed in a centralized way. So you have collected all your data already, you want to analyze it, we can do it. We can also as well deploy it at the edge of the infrastructure. 
So as soon as you fetch the data from your citizen or your customers, we can do some analytics and then report those analytics to a central repository. But already that information is uh, protected by this random noise that we checked. And as well, what we can do is like, you give me an original data set and we give you a synthetic version of it that respect the same statistical properties as the original data set, where, but where the privacy of individual has been protected. All right, so uh, our business model uh, is B2B. So uh, we identify as the possible early adopters, uh, banking and fintech, smart cities and health sectors. So if you are in one of these sectors and you identify with this problem, please reach to us. And the way that we, we imagine our product to go is like on a paper license basis and a deployment fee because a solution will be deploying your own infrastructure because we know by experience that companies are not, and governments are not likely to send data to someone else's infrastructure. And as well, some training if you need it to understand how to tune the privacy and the accuracy parameters. So we have validated uh, the problems of not being able to share data while respecting privacy with one company in the banking and fintech sector, with 10 companies in the smart city sector, and with two companies in the health sector. And we saw that companies in general are super afraid of dealing any analytics or data about uh, the behavior of the customer or citizens. And we also very validated that many of these companies are doing data anonymization, as I showed you before, uh, but maybe not in the best way. Right, so this is the, the progress that we have done, uh, thanks to DAPSI. So we started with enter DAPSI. And uh, so we were, we have a, you know, a working prototype that had two years based on research. And then thanks to DAPSI, we added nine uh, months of development, thinking about converting it, this prototype into a product on MVP. We joined uh, another incubator, Gear Ventures. Then we got um, money from uh, Vinova, which is an innovation agency in Sweden. And we were listed as one of the most promising research-based startups by the Royal Swiss Academies of Engineer Sciences. All of that, I will say that thanks to Dapsi that gave us a, a starting point and then all the other things were falling, falling off nicely. So uh, at the moment we have two POCs, uh, proof of concept going on with a mobility and an energy company. And we got two more letter of intents with the small cities and a biotech company. So the call for action for us is like, uh, we are looking for your data to apply your technology and trying to unleash the analytics about your customers or your citizens uh, in a safe way, where you, you can be sure that you respect the privacy. And that was Dipella and how to unleash the power of analytics. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alejandro. Uh, very good to see the progress from your first speech in DAPSI to now a big development from you and other teams. That's just great to see. Uh, let's move on now to the third project, Oratorio, which will be presented by Philippe Lussac and uh, Robin Prett. Uh, Philippe is CEO and founder of Grid Pocket, and uh, Robin is project manager and data engineer at Grid Pocket 2. Thank you, Miguel. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, so we will talk about the uh, Oratorio project, which is uh, promoted by the startup company uh, Grid Pocket uh, within the DAPSI uh, framework. Um, our company uh, is a startup specialized in uh, data management and uh, data portability uh, for energy. Um, we've been founded back in 2009. Our company is based in the south of France, in Sofia Antipolis, and we also have an office in uh, uh, Poland, uh, uh, where we do research and development. Uh, and to today we have over 1 million people who can access our applications uh, uh, through partnerships with digital utilities. Because the particularity of our uh, business model is that we work with uh, utility companies, providers of electricity and gas, and we help them to share the data with their customers and help customers to make uh, better decisions on energy efficiency. 
uh, and we also work a lot on the research uh, in cooperation with several research labs uh, across Europe. Now, uh, to give you some more background about the case that we are working on is that every uh, today there is a huge transformation going on in the energy uh, with respect to the way uh, the energy is being measured and the and managed uh, and we are helping utility companies uh, who provide electricity or gas or water to to you to deploy the digital systems that are required to inform to measure the energy consumption and then to inform users and help users to take better decisions and this involves both residential customers and business customers and the way we work is a white label so we are not really known to the large public we help utilities to deploy our off the shelf tools and uh, there is a lot of data exchanges going on in those systems we cooperate with major CRM or metering data management systems providers to ensure that our data hub can collect uh, and centralize a lot of uh, relevant energy information in such a way that we can produce uh, useful insights for, for customers. Uh, simply speaking, the, we manage through the partnerships uh, we have and through the consent we get from the end users. We managed to get the data from your electricity, gas, and uh, water meter, analyze this data, store it securely, uh, respecting all the privacy measures that are uh, imposed and uh, we impose on our own. Uh, and this way, we help customers to get better information and advice. Typically, users can save up to 20% of the energy bill and reduce their CO2 emissions. Now, it's great. Uh, this, uh, this is a very successful solution, but uh, the market is evolving very fast and we see more and more new innovative uh, ways of consuming energy. Uh, to give you just an example of two, uh, the first is electric vehicle. Uh, the electric cars are great, uh, but uh, they consume actually a lot of electricity. When you charge an electric car, uh, this car can consume uh, instantly as much as 10 or 20 houses. This is a huge energy demand that is generated from the electric vehicles. So the, we've been approached by some utility companies saying that, well, we have difficulties to manage the stability of our electric grid at the moment when there is a lot of cars charging at the same time. Uh, could we somehow share the information with the electric car charging uh, providers uh, in such a way that they could slow down or manage the electric charge depending on the availability of the energy, price of the energy and the capacity of the grid and also the consumption of people uh, near the charging station. So in this way, we could avoid uh, strong investments in reinforcing the grid and we could also avoid the additional co2 emissions related to the peak of energy consumption another uh, demand comes from uh, the heating applications and air conditioning they can represent up to 60 percent of the household energy consumption and again they contribute very strongly to the peaks of consumption in winter and summer and if somehow uh, providers of the heaters, air conditioners, uh, thermostats could uh, correlate uh, the decision of their system with the situation of the electric grid. Again, there is a lot of uh, economies and optimizations that, that could be done. So what we have decided to do is to build an open interface that will enable to securely share energy data of a user with its favorite service providers for car charging, for heating, for smart home, uh, maybe just for information, the user can choose. And this is what the Oratorio project is about. We want to orchestrate the exchange of data uh, around, the, around the household. And so what we have uh, decided to do is to follow the standardization that is going on uh, but not on the energy side because there was so much um, there's so much struggle today to between large players to define the standards for internet of things and uh, 
uh, and the management of some electric components. So we decided to base what we do, first of all, on the open standards from the web, and then to add uh, some additional ontologies and uh, references which are related to the energy. So we have a very lightweight um, framework for uh, energy data portability. So now in terms of the technical solution that we have decided to put in place uh, through the or oratorio project, uh, this is a, a solution which is based on the open source um, API uh, and of some open source components. Uh, this solution is being implemented as a way for a utility company to build an ecosystem with third parties uh, of service providers in such a way that the user has all the decisions to make in terms of the consent and sharing data and can benefit from this, this data sharing. And I will ask our research engineer, Robin, to talk more about the uh, technological implementation. Yes, thank you, Philippe. So I think we are short in time, so I will be uh, maybe faster to present this uh, architecture overview. So as you can see on the left side, you have the utility company, uh, which wants to, uh, to provide uh, his information to the third parties. And in order to do that, uh, we're doing data mapping parsing in the first time from the, uh, the their, their data model to our data model. We also provide interfaces to, um, um, to uh, help the end users or the consumer to managing the third parties uh, and the GDPR consents they have to the third parties. And also we provide uh, a connector to third parties in order to help them to uh, connect to the oratorio system. And uh, at the end, the end user access to new services. And for the data portability, uh, we made uh, a new ontology. So we made an ontology for energy providers uh, in order to um, interconnect every element, uh, every stakeholders uh, in, in, the, uh, in the data model. So we have the distributor who is in charge of uh, distributing the electricity, the consumer uh, which uh, is uh, consumed in electricity, and you have a service provider with selling energy, and finally the meter reading, uh, which where the data is generated. And to do that, uh, we use um, we use other ontology uh, like G consent and Sarif. We are uh, they are uh, open ontologies uh, that we use for uh, our own ontology, and uh, also um, we use JSON LD. So it's a, a standard, a new standard for uh, linked data uh, using JSON uh, to help us in the in this model. Okay, thank you, Robin. So um, now, what next based on this uh, this implementation, we have uh, developed uh, an MVP within Oratorio of the of the solution that we commercialize as a data hub for the for the utilities. And this data hub uh, actually serves uh, two functions. First of all, it enables internally for the utility to have a modular architecture for deployment of new additional value-added services for energy. For example, the energy control, energy analytics, so you can disaggregate usages through some third-party application, online agency for everything related to customer support, marketplace, gamification, integration of prosumers with PV and electric car charging, and uh, more deep in-depth analytics. And then this API enables to securely connect third parties into the ecosystem. Now, um, today we uh, work in partnership I think, Philip, you are, <clears throat> you are muted. Because time is over. Oh, let him finish, please. Hello? Yeah, you can wrap up. Please. Okay, um, so today we have all those utilities who are helping us to deploy those systems. And uh, um, we have done the first deployment of the uh, Oratorio specification actually uh, in uh, Monaco with one of our close uh, utility partners. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Philip and Robin, for the presentation. Very um, uh, useful and, 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 uh, and good to see um, different solutions applied in different sector. Uh, that was the case here. Uh, thank you very much. So let's proceed with uh, Open Export Project. It will be presented by Hans Jörg Happel, uh, co founder and CTO of Audriga. Welcome on board. The floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Miguel. And uh, hello, everybody here. Uh, my name is Hans Jörg. Uh, as, as, as you said already, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Audriga. And, um, oh, and um, what do we do as Audriga? So um, as a company, we exist um, since um, more or less 10 years. So we have a little bit of an anniversary today. And uh, our company was actually already founded with the vision of data portability in mind. So um, what we basically do is we have a software as a service uh, web-based uh, migration tool, which helps you to switch your email or groupware provider. Uh, so groupware is a very broad term. Most of you might know like Microsoft Exchange or something like that. Um, but also all the data you have in there, like contact calendars, tasks, um, which might also be used in different services than just uh, groupware services. And um, yeah, we, as I said, it's a self-service tool. So you can try it out by yourself. If you go to a website, www.odriga.com, um, there is a, a user interface where you select the source provider as the destination provider um, and um, enter your credentials and you can do actually the uh, transfer of the data. So actually pretty close to what uh, GDPR article 20 is, is envisioning in a way. Um, and especially also we act as an intermediary here. So we are not by ourselves the source or the destination provider, but we are like an independent entity. Um, and we also do support what the GDPR calls the direct transfer. So it's not that the user downloads a file and uploads a file, but we do aut the automatic total transfer of the data from the source to the destination. Um, and a simple example, um, like you, you, you could have uh, a user migrating from Google G Suite to Office 365 or Microsoft 365, how it's called now, um, and copy over all the emails, all the calendars, um, all the contacts, and so on. Um, we do that actually, so you, you can use our service as a direct user, um, but our main business case is actually to uh, co cooperate with uh, hosting companies and ISPs. Um, so some of our customers, for instance, are um, Amazon Web Services, uh, IONOS, um, Liberty Global, um, GoDaddy Europe, so, so quite a number of well-known hosting brands. And they basically use our service to onboard. Yeah? So that's, what, uh, that's why we typically say we, we are doing migration, because typically the perspective is from the person um, um, onboarding to the new provider. Um, but if you think about it, data portability is actually the reverse yeah, or the other side of the coin because it's, it's directed to the uh, provider where people uh, go away from. And um, interestingly, in the past years, we also tried to sell our hosting partners the idea of um, switching away like this data portability approach, but obviously most of them were motivated to gain new customers. And uh, since there was no law in place, only very few uh, thought about also um, making the offboarding easy. Um, so that's what we do. So what did we actually now um, do within, um, uh, within DAPSI on, on top of that? Um, so maybe very shortly um, uh, uh, as a motivation, our domain. So obviously I think email group is one of the largest domains in terms of personal data on the internet. Um, and there is, um, so, so most, some of these systems do have APIs. There is even standards, most of you know, like vCard or iCalendar. Um, however, in many cases, these uh, standards in a way are, um, you know, not really built for portability in a strict sense and also have their uh, problems. You need to download, upload a file again, which makes it tricky and also the properties are not always well matched. Um, so uh, in what I presented to you before, like Office 365 Gmail, we typically use the existing APIs, legacy APIs by the vendors. Um, we also do have connectors for Carta of Kaldaf with those limitations. And, um, but there are still a lot of systems, like especially um, um, webmail systems, like you might know Roundcube, which is um, more or less uh, the um, best well-known uh, open source and free uh, webmail system, a lot of uh, ISPs and email providers use. And these systems, uh, in some cases, don't even have the uh, recard um, export functionality. And so we thought about how can we improve that and how can we make data portable for the millions of users of these systems. And um, there is actually something going on um, in the ITF um, in terms of standards, which is called the JMAP protocol. So the, there is a JMAP working group, which initially started to build something um, uh, like a better IMAP. 
for accessing email data. But over time, actually, the work of this working group also extended to other data you have in a grouper system like contacts, calendars, and so on. And um, the interesting thing is that this seems to evolve also in a way as, uh, to, to a kind of an interoperability protocol for all the different types you have in such a group based system um, uh, based on IETF standards. And um, so we joined forces basically um, uh, with that uh, uh, activity. And um, we are also a member of the CalConnect consortium, which is very tightly uh, related to the ITF working group. And um, yeah, so we basically already contributed uh, to the contact and calendar uh, standards uh, in, in parts. And um, within DAPSI, we especially pushed forward also uh, a whole new ITF draft for tasks, for instance, which was not so much addressed now. And um, yeah, so the overall idea is basically that this can be a future standard actually to be adopted by um, groupware, webmail, but also like, you know, task management, connect management, maybe CRM systems. So all systems that deal in some or the other way uh, with this uh, contact calendar task data, which is very fundamental um, to many of our daily uh, work processes. And um, on the other hand, there are then also, if, if service uh, do expose that in a, in a large fashion, um, there is of course a large incentive for client applications, may it be on desktop, may it be on mobile, um, to also adapt uh, that and um, yeah, be more interoperable with the existing systems. Um, and yeah, you might know, for instance, especially on mobile, uh, the situation uh, is mostly that there is like active sync very popular, which is a very proprietary protocol by Microsoft and also not covering all the data. Um, so certainly there's also a, a lot of a benefit for mobile application ecosystem here. And um, there is actually even some of those applications popping up. So there is in the NGI pointer initiative, which is kind of a sister project to uh, NGI Dapsi, as far as I understood it. Um, there is uh, uh, an Android uh, client developed further, which is basically also using uh, or basing on this JMAP standard. Um, yeah, there is basically um, on that approach with introducing JMAP as an intermediary API. Um, I already told a little bit, there is two benefits you could, you could draw from this. So one um, is, is actually the classic um, uh, user switching to another provider or import export case, which basically we do um, uh, support in our daily business. Um, but also, as I, as I mentioned before already, um, if that API is in place once, also um, a little more uh, different data portability cases can be achieved. Um, like, you know, something I would call it maybe incremental data portability, where you have maybe a client interacting with two different uh, data storages or something like that. Um, so, you know, data portability not always is just import export or switching hard from one provider to the other. But uh, of course, it's also concerned to use case where user can, users can share data between different apps. And um, I think the important message here is um, that work on JMAP basically um, is, is neutral in terms of the actual data portability approach followed by um, uh, or, or used by a user or by server provider. And um, many different scenarios are possible here. Um, so what have been, what have been, what have been what have we been doing within um, Open Export in particular besides uh, contributing to the standardization? Um, so we also started implementing uh, things and um, one of the major achievements we have is that we uh, bootstrapped a number of plugins for popular open source webmail systems. Um, I already mentioned Runcube. Um, many of you might also know Nextcloud or Hordy, which is used by a lot of universities. Um, and um, we basically um, yeah, developed um, after the standard uh, first uh, implementations um, for these uh, different web mailers uh, to enable them speaking JMAP. And um, yeah, so that they can be used uh, for all these different use cases. And um, this is still uh, ongoing work to a certain extent. So that there is functionality already there, especially in terms of contacts and calendars. Uh, but it might not yet support the absolute full breadth of the uh, JMAP API, which is quite powerful and so on. Uh, but of course, it's also the open source idea here that um, there is maybe some uptake by the community. 
Um, as, an, as an side effect also, um, we will maybe come up with a generic JMAP adapter for file storage systems. This is not yet released, but under development. Um, but this is something that came across also during the development. And there is also uh, some pieces of JMAP library code, which for instance, other open source projects could use in order to write plugins for their own system um, in order to um, make it uh, compatible with those uh, JMAP standards. And there's also some interest by vendors um, uh, that came uh, to contact to us also due to uh, our DUPSI involvement and um, hearing about all these activities. And um, yeah, we're already working on that. Um, so we are very uh, confident that maybe that will be really become some um, some kind of uh, widespread standards um, in here. Um, we are also using uh, this kind of software um, obviously within our own platform. So we have also to our uh, you know our SaaS self-service migration platform we have an adapter which allows us also to access uh, these kind of plugins, uh, for instance, in order to migrate from Roundcube. Um, to Office 365 or the other way around. Um, and we are actually also using these kind of um, plugins developed within Dubsy um, in actual projects um, where we do- Hans, can you uh, please conclude? Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm already finished, thanks. Um, and um, yeah, if you wanna, wanna have a look by yourself, there is our GitHub account where you can find all the source. Uh, there is a link to the ITF specs. And um, yeah, um, if there's any questions, just come contact us and we are looking forward uh, to uh, continue working on this also in the future. Thanks. Thank you very much and sorry for interrupting. Uh, well, it's beautiful to see uh, a solution that will benefit millions of users uh, to benefit from the data portability right. So let's move now to the next project and the next team, uh, Proof for IT Data Project. It will be presented by Ben de Meester. Uh, is a postdoctoral uh, researcher at ID Lab, uh, University of Ghent, Belgium. He's researching high quality linked data generation and transformation. Uh, then the floor is yours. Yes. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. So, um, I said I'm an amazing and um, I'm very happy to uh, present you the Prof. IT Data Project. Um, I don't think I need to convince anyone about the need for control of uh, personal data. That's why we're all here. Um, and uh, within the Prof. IT Data Project, we have been looking into the technical problems that get us from the situation that you have right now into this kind of vision of having full control over your own personal data. So before we can start, um, let's first see like what are the problems with, with personal data currently. Um, well, the big problem is that it's scattered across all the different service providers that you have. You can have your address book in Facebook, in an in, in address book in LinkedIn, and and each service provider has a different take on what an address book should be. And that's, that's perfectly fine. That's why there are different applications. However, that also makes it very hard um, to put the data together. They're all structured heterogeneously in very different ways. And this contributes to vendor locking. Your data only works within the specific apps they're in. And then there is the solid vision. Uh, the solid vision is to create an ecosystem where your data is no longer centralized within the different applications, but actually under, um, under your own control. So no longer under the control of the existing uh, big tech companies, but um, as a knowledge graph under the user's control. So the solid vision is to go to a world where your data and your applications are split uh, from each other and actually live decentralized. So you can have a social feed application that works with your own calendar, your own um, address book, but you can also have a meeting scheduler app that also works with the calendar, also with the address book, um, and they can actually work with the same sets of data. And this solid vision would allow users to break free from their vendor locking. Now, that sounds great, but if we then go into practice, how do we get there? Let's say we want to control your own personal contact book. 
to, to get into the solid ecosystem, to reclaim control over your personal data, you first need to get your data into its solid data storage first. So you start with your uh, original address book, like Google Contacts, and you might even find a tool that does the conversion for you. But then you realize that your contact information is scattered across your office account, Facebook account, LinkedIn, et cetera, et cetera. And you need to do the transformation again and again. And that's when the problems start. You have duplicated contacts, addresses that are formatted differently, um, data that is missing in one data set, but not in the other. And it becomes almost impossible to move from the current ecosystem um, to a solid ecosystem using existing initiatives and keep your existing data. And why is that? Because the existing initiatives are typically hard-coded one-to-one uh, transfer uh, systems. So you basically move from one web service to another. And this means you actually need to implement different um, adapters. You have to do actual development time if you want to support different web services. And in the end, you, you basically just move your data from one service to the other. You, you keep the same level of control. So these existing initiatives lack the transparency transparency and interoperability um, to really create a decentralized world. You, you end up not knowing how your personal data is processed and you end up in a similar situation as before. So the problem is not actually how to migrate your existing data because then you just move your data around. The problem is how to integrate your existing data. I get it, have a system that is just as easy to set up when you're integrating one data source or a hundred data sources. And given we're talking about personal data, um, we need a system that is fully transparent. So we know exactly what happens with our personal data. So if you like to have personal total control over your digital profile data, that is why we have um, worked on the Profit IT Data Project. A flexible tool for transparent transfer of personal data to personal data stores. So what is Proper IT Data? It's a data processing platform to integrate any data source into a personal data space. So your LinkedIn information, your Facebook, your Google contacts, but also your imager, Flickr, pictures, all of them can go through the same platform and they, uh, the proper IT data platform does all the heavy lifting. So managing all the authentication, setting up the infrastructure to extract and transform your personal data, um, all of that is handled by proper IT data. The only thing you need to do as an end user is choose which data parts you want to integrate. How you can actually choose which data parts you integrate is actually a way is is configured using uh, rml.io. rml.io is, is an extension on top of a, a W3C standard, uh, R2 RML, and actually also going into a standardization track. Um, and this allows you to really create uh, presets. So extensible and reusable configurations that um, allows you to make a very customizable and transparent uh, pipeline. So you can um, really configured. These are the data fields I want to use from my LinkedIn page, from my Facebook page, from my Google contacts. And you can, uh, up to the finest detail, shape how you want your data to look like and where it goes to. And because everything is described in this kind of configuration, it's also 100% transparent. You can do automatic assessment, validation of the uh, platform. So you don't actually have to move any data around to actually see how it works. And this is as far as we know, quite unique in, in, in the current data portability landscape. And on top of the Proffer IT data uh, platform is a, a demonstrator, which provides like a one-click solution to reclaim control over your personal data. So you just select one of the presets and the Proffer IT data framework moves your data around in an interoperable format. The system itself is built on open source and open standards. We use open source software because we, if actual development would be needed, it's actually easier to create customizations. It also increases the transparency of the platform itself. The source code as well is available. And we built on 
mature libraries such as rml.io and uh, communica and all of the data that is generated um, is um, using open standards for increased interoperability so we make use of semantic web knowledge graphs and the rdf uh, model um, to create the integration uh, model for your personal data and as said we push it uh, into the solid ecosystem to have um, personal data spaces with full personal access control. Um, so as you can see, the, the property data um, platform is quite a technical one. So who is it for? It's actually for knowledge scientists to create these kinds of presets, best practice data transfer configurations, and actually to integrate it into existing um, personal data applications or use it as a preprocessor for uh, personal data applications. Because these configured property data setups let users easily transfer their data for any use case. I also think that this whole for any use case is kind of the unique selling proposition of, of property data. By making use of these fine grained configurations instead of implementations, you can really provide a lot of flexibility in data sources, making it also very cheap to integrate new sources and have a lot of control um, and transparency over your uh, data integration needs. And finally, the, the platform itself, you can see it as a kind of extract, transform, load uh, platform. So you basically move the data around, but you could also see it as a synchronization platform. So you can keep using your existing services, but in the meantime, also bootstrapping solid applications. So if I can kind of conclude um, of what we were able to do in, um, in, in, in Dopsy is that we were really um, able to bootstrap this kind of platform. So we could improve the technology readiness levels of the core uh, technical platform and improve functionality of the open source uh, libraries or components we have been working on. Um, so RMLIO and Communica and integrated solid and create the demonstrator. Uh, in the future, we're currently uh, working into expanding the platform to really create an integration platform as a service uh, built on top of this open core uh, that we have been bootstrapping uh, within the Dopsy project. And our vision is to look beyond uh, personal data. As said, the platform is use case independent, so we want to expand applicability to, to any kind of use case, not just personal data, but um, for example, Gaia X, um, any kind of um, application to increase value. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right on time. Thank you very much for this and for also this very um, different approach to uh, the data portability challenges. Thank you. Uh, let's proceed with the uh, UI transfers project. And we have here Tom Hagemans, I hope I did pronounce it well, co founder and research lead at Digita and Research Fellow at the University of Leuven. The floor is yours. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Hey. Uh, so I'm Tom Hagemans, co-founder and research lead of Digita indeed. And Digita is a company with a sole focus on solid, just uh, like uh, Ben de Meester was uh, just explaining, we're working on the same technology. Currently, we have several customers such as banks and governments, and we employ a team of 10 people. In this presentation, I will present you the research that we've done around a question that our customers kept on asking. What about the GDPR? Well, the idea of this research was to use data sharing patterns as a tool to tackle legal, consideration, legal considerations in the solid ecosystem. Keep in mind that you can access a full research report on our resources pages as well. So one of the most important use cases of solid is data reuse. On this slide, you can see an example of how this looks like from the perspective of a user. So here you as a citizen can reuse your data from the government to easily apply for a life insurance at your bank. But to start, we noticed that data reuse within SOLID is different from what we are used to. So first of all, when data is reused with SOLID, the receiving party might get continuous access to the original copy of the data. Second, with SOLID, it's possible to ensure the authenticity of the data, even when it is copied. And third, a person could reuse his or her data in many different contexts. That means that the involved parties might function in different capacity. 
For example, the data transfer could be between a government and a private organization or between two private organizations. But sadly, these observations make it hard to apply the current privacy legislation in a straightforward way. So that is why Dirk, a colleague of mine, and I came up with several research goals. So first, we had to look for patterns that summarize many of the ways uh, in how data can be reused in a solid ecosystem. Next, we had to investigate how these patterns influence the user experience. And finally, we had to create a framework to determine which pattern was best suited based on legal considerations. So let me show you what we found. So on this slide, you can see the three patterns that describe how data from one party can be reused at another party. The first pattern describes a situation where the recipient of the data can get a direct and continuous access to the original copy of the data. The second pattern describes a situation where the recipient of the data gets access to a copy of the data that is stored at the person, him or herself. The third party uh, pattern sorry, describes a situation where the recipient of the data gets access to the data, but without asking a person for consent or permission. In the second part of the research, we have investigated how these patterns could impact the user experience. Without, without wanting to be exhaustive, we have listed several components that we see returning when we would actually implement the patterns. For each component, we have come up with several possible journeys and listed their advantages and disadvantages. So on this slide, you can see an example of one possible user journey for the first pattern. This user journey is particularly interesting because it makes sure that a user should not have to select his or her pod because this responsibility is delegated to a software artifact that's called a data browser. In the third part of the study, we created a framework to determine which pattern should be applied, taking into account legal considerations in Belgium. The framework is based upon several considerations and these considerations can be used to determine how data is processed from a legal perspective. Afterwards, we have listed how these considerations should be applied to a different context. And this was necessary because there are different regulations for when a person reuses his or her data from a private company at a government, from a government to a government, from a private company to a private company, or a government to a private company. So finally, to make sure that the results of this research would be applicable in practice, we constructed a decision table per context to aid legal experts in picking the right pattern. So in conclusion, in this research, we constructed patterns that summarize how data can be reused within SOLID, investigated the impact of these patterns on the user experience, and created a framework to determine which pattern is suited based on legal considerations. If you want to dive into the nitty gritty details, you can simply browse to digital.ai slash resources and download the report for free. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Tom, for uh, saving us uh, some minutes there. Thank you uh, for the presentation as well. Uh, let's move on to the last but not least project uh, uh, with Alias, and which will be presented by Mehdi uh, Medjawi. Uh, Mehdi is the founder of Alias, the company that is building um, APIs to make GDPR programmable, and is also founder of API Days, the conferences, uh, the main event series on APIs and portability. So I hope uh, you are ready, Mary, to to your presentation. Maybe you were expecting more five minutes. Yeah, you're here yeah. with us. Cool. Are you here? Yeah. Sounds good. So I will share my screen right now. So you said five minutes, is it said 10 minutes earlier, but uh, yeah, okay, perfect. Are, are you able to see the screen in, uh, in, in full screen? It's coming, right, yeah, perfect now. Yeah, perfect, hello everybody, thank you. I'm really glad to be here. Uh, I'm really excited about portability in all sense. And we've done a lot of work into that aspect like our other friends uh, here and I would uh, love to present uh, uh, now. So really at Alias, uh, our mission is to make GDPR programmable for developers uh, to reduce cost, increase scalability and make portability finally possible. 
we will you will we will uh, tell you how we came to our this conclusion and how to do it in our opinion so a uh, lot of people here have talked about you know uh, the the the, the, uh, the potential of personal data we found this interesting number on salesforce state of connected customer that up to 93% of customers are ready, users, customers, citizens are ready to share personal data as long as it's used in a fair way and in a transparent way. And that brings them a value in their citizen or customer experience. So again, the, the question can, could be asked in different ways, but let's say people are okay to share data as long as they are staying in control, right? So the mission of every company now should be to make a personal data liquid, easy and portable for companies and people. So we've worked during the DAPSI project, we've, we've worked hard on the research report that was the base of our technical work. Uh, and actually we interviewed like almost 300 companies. Uh, we, uh, we helped 50 people to take all their data back from all these companies. And we, we, we checked what was not working with GDPR portability as, as it was uh, made today. And we found uh, six reasons why it was not working and uh, of course many reasons, but gathered into six. And let's say uh, sometimes, you know, a lot of people here have experienced it. They don't send you a date, your, your full data because they, they, they claim you did not provide it as, and you provided it, but they don't do that. Sometimes they say, they, they make you wait three, four, five months. Uh, sometimes they, uh, they, they give you data in a non-usable format. So everybody who have tried this stuff knows this. And it's almost the case for everybody, uh, for every company, it's, this is what happens, right? Um, so when we interviewed the DPO of these companies or the IT managers, they told us one thing that looks simple. They said, okay, we're, we're not, we are not just really able to do it. Of course, some are maybe hypocrites, but let's say for many, many companies, they say we're not able to do it. And in the last talent report, up to 70% uh, of public institutions are not able to give your, full, your data under 30 days notice. They're just not able to do it. They don't know, they don't have a 360 view of your personal data. Uh, so for some big giants, they probably have, and they, they are hypocrites, but just to say, it's, pro it's mostly a problem of ability to understand, govern the data internally, more than really the willingness to, uh, uh, to, uh, to share the data that they, uh, that they, they don't have, right? So, so it's a, I invite you, you can go on the report and www.ls.dev slash report. You can see this, uh, this uh, eight, nine months research, all the numbers, everything that we found, uh, uh, the interviews and, and, and everything, just to say that, yeah, we, uh, we, we also call this report the port portability, the forgotten right, because just an example, on 800 fines that has been given by uh, national uh, authorities on, on data, there is no fine on portability. Article 20 is never mentioned. There have been no fines under three years and nobody respects it. So there is also some issues. So it's a right nobody is afraid of, right? So our conclusion after uh, six months of, of, of research and building, because in the DAPSI project we have built, we have decentralized like OAuth protocols. We've done some stuff that really make portability possible like our fellow friends before, right? And actually the conclusion is that yes, they don't, they are not able to handle GDPR. They are not able to under GDPR at scale to know what they, what's the data they have available and uh, how they how they can deliver it to you, right? So uh, just for the fun story, we published a report last week uh, for the third year of, uh, of GDPR anniversary. We have been uh, featured on Hacker News, <laughs> a famous like say uh, tech uh, tech online media. We have been on the front page and we have already 70k downloads. So just to say, we put portability beyond expectations. So we're really glad on this. But let's say that, yeah, the result of this study that and, and the solution we're, we, are, we, are, we have built is that, yeah, all, everybody knows GDPR is a pain for all stakeholders. We've seen that up to 40% of the compliance budget can be just on legal fees, right? So it can't scale at is done today. And this is what, what we identified why portability is not made in many, many companies. So the only solution is to make GDPR programmable, right? So what does that mean? That means that today GDPR is mostly handled by static documents like Word, Excel documents. And so it can't scale. They don't know at any time where is your data to be able to transfer it to you, right? Of course, they, are inter they have interoperability and stuff, but interoperability can be handled by developers, right? Activity Hub and other stuff like that, uh, like API, middleware, we can handle interoperability. But the thing is that if they don't know what to send you, that's the main problem. Even companies who are in this, in this world who are giving tool for data protection officers 
to handle uh, GPR are mostly tools that makes declarative stuff. It's not directly tied to the data, so they know exactly how to transfer the data, where it is, and they can transfer it easily. You know, that's the main reason of these tools. Therefore, DPOs developers are not involved, and to have full portability, you need to have the data protection officers and the developers in company to work hand in hand to be able to transfer the data and respect regulations, right? And the user. Some people know these numbers. You know, GPR is not cost a lot. It's not is not respected and coming and comes. Uh, uh, across many, many countries now who are inspired by GDPR. So the problem will be big and the fines doesn't scare so much, right? Uh, uh, Sometimes we found that they mostly are not able to do it. So we think uh, that when law is about the code, code must be the law. The only way for people to respect GDPR portability and GDPR in general is that if we transform GDPR into code and we will see what does that mean, so we believe that first DPOs and developer must collaborate. As long as we develop tools only for DPOs and the developers are not involved, it can't work, it can't scale because developers are, are the one actually implementing it, are the one actually you know, knowing where is the data, where the database and where, what are the hosting providers and everything, right? So we need, we need tools that makes developers and DPO uh, collaborate. And just to, uh, before telling you exactly what, what, what we have built, I would just say that, you know, um, it was really hard to deploy an application uh, 15 years ago, but when we put infrastructure as code, we developed the DevOps culture that enabled to have, you know, now we can deploy application with few lines of code, right? Then a few years later, we thought, yeah, security is boring. Security is a, is a problem in many companies that slow many projects. But if we put security as code, we call it DevSecOps, we could actually deploy security and make it not a blocker, right? So company like Screen are doing that. They've just been acquired half a billion dollar uh, recently. So we believe that regulation should be code, right? And we call it the dev reg ops. So we develop API and tools to, for, to have developers and DPOs to manage GDPR compliance at scale, especially prog uh, portability at first, but not only portability. So what do we do? We, our APIs enable uh, uh, developers with DPOs to track all the events of a user lifecycle. When he visits, sign up, log in, open a newsletter, search, fill a card, whatever he does, become a customer ask for a subject right request. And with all these events which are tracked, we are able to know exactly the GDPR context of every user. So we have 80 GDPR fields that we follow, but every time something happens, we can change the duration conservation. We can change the, we can manage the constant, renew the constant and everything. We know exactly at what point uh, the user is, uh, uh, is in life cycle and what GDPR context is applying here. So just an example, uh, if we take uh, an infrastructure, Many companies have personal information uh, instances. We have our API enabled to put a GDPR context at close to each of these, right? And for example, if you have a 1 million user in your application who sign up in a specific context, but you know that these contexts are different per country, for example. So let's say uh, 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 half of them comes from Germany, half of them from, comes from France. Just imagine a new regulation change in Germany. What would happen because we have the context on every user, we are able to send notifications that the, GDP, the context have changed. We send it to DPOs, to developers, thanks to our APIs. And like this, you can monitor really uh, your uh, GDPR compliance as, it, as, as if it was code, because you are able to make uh, requests, queries, like uh, uh, as much as you want, right? And you can update context. So for these ones, for example, the French will have maybe one year extra the German will not have uh, a one-year extra conservation in this case. You, you may need to, add, to ask the constant again to the, the, the German here in red, where the French one, you can still wait one year. So this is really the way to manage GDPR directly in the IT system. So the, our end goal is really to be the, uh, the, the GDPR compliance unit test, as we call it, to answer for everybody to be able to answer in the, in the, in the, in, in the company, is this personal information uh, personal identifiable information GDPR compliant. Can we use it? And like this, we when you want to deploy an application, you can you have a notification. Say, look, yes, the purpose is right, uh, so you can use it, or the purpose is cannot be uh, uh, right for this uh, for this application and for this uh, uh, country. Okay, you cannot use it uh, directly, right? So this is the Dev RegOps approach, putting regulation as a way to be tested at any time in the applications to be sure that you're compliant by design when you go in production. So we are building these APIs. We, we just released the first one. It's a search engine for data conservation duration, purpose, and portability. You can go at, uh, on, it's for French uh, DPOs for now only. 
uh, on duret conservation.fr. And like this, you can have already a search engine with an accessible API to handle data conservation duration as a piece of code that you can integrate in your system. We are doing more for subprocessors and others right now to be sure that yeah, GDPR can be handled uh, like this. Uh, people already back us, like INRIA, you know, the French national, let's say, IT uh, lab, and Jay Dapsy, of course, and we raised a seed round with Elia and, and, and Elia partners and Angels, and the founders of, of Elias are uh, the part of API Days community, uh, and founders of the API Days conference series, and part of my data as a steering room member. Please conclude. Yeah, that's the, that's the conclusion. Just to say, we are now a team of four jurists in, in PhD in law and four developers. Uh, we are hiring to make uh, GDPR and portability programmable. And uh, yes, that was that's what we built thanks to Dapsy. Without Dapsy, it would have been a lot more harder to start uh, a company like that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mehdi. Uh, huge congrats on the on the report. Definitely that portability is not forgotten, at least for, for a moment. Uh, thank you very much for all the presentation. Uh, I will share on the, um, the chat the link where you can have the details of all the projects that are funded uh, through NGI uh, from the first open call and the second open call and you have also have the links to the to each of the, the teams so you can have all the details there and uh, I think we are going now to a break and we will meet again at 3 p.m CET if I'm not mistaken so uh, yes have a good break and we will come back for the two remaining uh, round tables so see you in a minute. Thank you. Welcome back, everybody. I hope that you could stretch your legs with this short break. So it's my pleasure now to um, introduce the next part. Um, thanking again the speakers uh, from the uh, previous session. Uh, it was really great to hear how you guys um, put the portability question into operation, into practice. And of course, all this wouldn't be possible without the user and user experience and uh, all questions around the uh, adoption. So for this uh, reason, we have uh, chosen this as the topic of the next uh, panel discussion. And we would be uh, like very interested to hear uh, what's your take on this challenge. <laughs> and with that, I'm just uh, giving it over to, to Michelle who will be uh, moderating the next uh, 45 minutes. Uh, just a small, uh, uh, short information to the audience. Uh, uh, your questions uh, will be taken at the end part of the session here. So please uh, don't hesitate to shoot them on the chat. Uh, we are very much looking forward to have uh, like lively in in interaction with the public. So I, I give it over to, to Michel, Christoph, Jan, uh, Hans, Jörg, um, uh, Philippe, Jean-Baptiste uh, and Ben. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, welcome to this uh, to this panel. So we have on the panel we have uh, Christoph Fabianek from uh, Own Your Data and the, the DIP project. We have Ben de Meester from iMac and the Pro for IT Data project. Philip Glushak and Jean Baptiste Bernard, both from uh, Grid Pocket and the Oratorio project, and Hans Jörg Happel from Audriga and the Open Export project. And um, so the topic is uh, about data portability specifically. Uh, usability and user experience. And um, the funny thing is when you think about data portability, 
it's always sort of a next step from data export. So um, being allowed by some service to download a zip file with your data in some data format is, uh, is one step, but then uh, what do you do with that? You know, where do you take it to and, and what is the format that's in, how do you use it? And that's usually where if you give a user this data, um, then uh, th that's probably where it stops. They have a right to have their data, but once they have it, they can't use it. So how do you make it usable for them? So um, I think data portability almost by definition is about the usability of data export because you can almost always export your data uh, from one system and import it in another system, even if it's like printing everything out and then typing it back in with data entry. That's the most manual way to uh, have data portability. And so instead going from manual data portability to seamless data portability is, is the challenge that we want to uh, um, that we want to solve with all the DOPSI projects. So uh, that's why I'm uh, excited to uh, be uh, honored to be to be moderating this panel. Um, and um, I'm, when I think of uh, data portability in the context of the today's webinar as a whole, which is about the web after platforms, um, I think it's a, a big part of it uh, of uh, getting away from platforms is data portability, and, but it's not necessarily the only way. And I think there's uh, being in control of your data can um, maybe work in four ways. So uh, one obvious way maybe is switching. So just like when you switch a mobile provider, you can take your phone number with you to the other provider. Uh, that's phone number portability uh, is makes it much more feasible for users to switch, which means that the companies have to try harder to uh, have user retention and that makes them compete better and it also makes new entrants to the market have a fairer chance of getting users from other uh, existing providers. And the next one would be uh, to synchronize or, or reuse or combine your data from various services. So maybe you've filled in a web form on one service and then um, you go fill in this your home address again on some other service. But maybe your browser remembered what you wanted to fill in. Um, or maybe you have your data, your the service that you used already put your data in a solid pod. And now this other data allows you to import it, to, to use it directly from your solid pod. Um, or maybe you have a, um, a sub open source project in a mercurial, repos mercurial repository and you have a constant synchronization to a GitHub repository. Uh, so it's just the same source of uh, data, but it's, uh, show it's synced live. So it appears in multiple places. Um, so then it's not about switching anymore, but it's about reusing the same data in different places. And that also of course helps users and companies to break away from platforms because they become more connected. And that would be the next way in which uh, we can, if we want to switch away from platforms, data portability is not the only thing we need to think about. Um, another thing would be federation, as we know from email, for instance. But uh, if you look at, for instance, calendars, when you invite somebody for a business meeting, you can send them an email with a calendar invite that maybe they can import straight into Google Calendar or, or straight into Outlook. And those form it where one um, business decides to use Outlook and another business decides to use uh, G Suite um, and they federate. So uh, that is also, an, of course, an important part of how we can escape from platforms. And the fourth one I wanted to mention is um, building blocks of an operating system or a, an app platform. If you think of Android, for instance, which is so powerful now, um, there's um, when you build an application, say you're a startup that builds, uh, uh, I don't know, a photo app, and you do it on Android, then uh, you have all these Google services and all these integrations, and you can share photos from your app to other apps, or maybe from other apps into your app. And uh, if you want to do anything related to location, then you probably need to integrate with Google location services. And the more um, um, 
well, the more uh, features you want to add to your product, the more aware you're going to be that you're on the Google platform. And so uh, one thing um, that maybe as an open source community would, we should try to build is a sort of um, uh, is building blocks for app developers so that developer experience uh, is better when you try to build an app that is not based on platforms, but it's, that's based on open standards. Where are the building blocks you can use? And, and if you say, oh, I'm going to build a solid app, where is there a solid operating system that lets you say, well, this is how you deal with users. Um, this is how you deal with location, et cetera. And so not just how can we help people switch from one service to another, but also how can we help uh, data to be more fluid and more location independent um, in general? How can we help different platforms become interoperable while people stay in um, uh, so federate these uh, these platforms and how can we make the whole stack of technologies that we build uh, uh, apps on top of um, be more open so 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 trying to make the scope very wide and then maybe we can bring it down a bit uh, now in the specific uh, project which is to provide some context of uh, of data portability as we talk about it. Uh, so for this session, I would like to give each project um, uh, five, what would you say, five minutes uh, to define uh, how their project relates to usability. And um, uh, after that, we'll have a, a short uh, open discussion and uh, with the panel. And after that, we'll have questions from the chat. So you can start writing questions in the chat already when you have them. And um, then in the last part of this panel, um, the panelists will answer questions from the audience. So to start the first the, the round of um, uh, of project pitches, I would like to invite uh, Christopher Fabianek from On Your Data, the, the IP project. And um, I think it's very uh, timely. Uh, the the vaccination passport uh, looks at yellow fever, but of course now with the, uh, I don't know where you are, but the Netherlands, it's very sunny and thinking about where I wanna, if I can go on holidays this summer, and uh, I'm probably, if I wanna fly somewhere, I'm gonna probably have to show some sort of proof of corona vaccination at the border. And um, yeah, I wonder what the, um, the usability aspects of that are. Do I show them a QR code? How are How is this country gonna use my medical records? Etc. So, um, Christoph, uh, the virtual floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Michelle. Um, hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, actually, I'm working the last 15, almost 16 years uh, in areas where we worked a lot on usability and I had a lot of uh, user interaction. And so, this is something that I spent quite some time on. And I'm very happy actually now in the last nine months in the DIPS, the Digital Immunization Passport project, that we address a very specific problem right now. So how can we handle our vaccination information? And actually, I want to really uh, continue where Philippe, uh, just in the 10 minutes presentation before uh, for the project, uh, asked the question, why is um, um, yellow passport? Uh, most probably all of you have such a passport. Um, why was it never digitalized? It exists for 20, 30 years now. And I think one of the aspects was also usability. And I have uh, written down a few aspects because usability is quite a broad aspect, uh, quite broad topic. What aspects actually are relevant and why was it so hard to uh, digitalize this um, yellow passport and what maybe can become easier in the future? So the first one I think is how do we store the information? Uh, with my passport, this is actually quite easy. I have it somewhere in a drawer. I uh, haven't used it in the last few uh, years, actually. Just now with COVID, of course, you have to uh, get it out again. Uh, but somehow, I exactly knew where it was stored. There was also the feeling it is stored somewhere else. The government maybe has some data. And also in our implementation, actually, we said, yes, we want to have it stored in two places. I have my own copy. I think this is very important from a human-centric perspective that I have the data in my control, but I also have to somehow have some backup at the clinic, at the uh, general practitioner's office, 
who gives me the vaccination, uh, vaccination to store this data. Also, if I go to the uh, airport this summer, when I go on vacation and my uh, vaccination passport uh, is checked, there will be some data trace. I think the important part here is also, and this brings us to the second question of usability, managing the data. How can we manage the consent? when we give someone information. So I go to the doctor and says, yes, uh, of course, uh, my identity needs to be checked. If it is a booster uh, shot, what data is already available? And what we're using there is a technology we call usage policies, machine readable description of um, my consent information when I give the data. I think it's very important. Right now we see on the web, if we go somewhere, we have pages of information. Actually, nobody's reading it. We're seeing it now with cookies. Um, just people are bored and or not bored, or they're just overwhelmed with information. They just consent to it. And I think providing here more fine-grained uh, control of the information that is actually necessary to say, okay, you can use it for research, but you're not allowed to use it for marketing. I think this is an important step. Um, another thing that we put actually quite some effort into it is, and this is also from my background uh, with my data, my data global is the human as point of integration. The, if I want to manage my data, uh, we have a personal data store where this information can be uh, stored. Uh, right now, uh, just last week, we received some funding to implement now an SSI wallet um, with a company in Germany where we can store our data. And how can we make this really possible that the data, or that uh, humans manage the data, having it maybe on their phone, having a personal data store, and can really interact with this data. I think this is very important to give uh, people the feeling that they are in control of the data. This brings me to the next point, actually, and this is data literacy. We are building so much data and so much uh, function, uh, generating data, and we are building so much functionality. Uh, and I think therefore it's so important to have events like that one here to talk with people, uh, demonstrate what is possible. And we we'll need to repeat this message, how to use this technology. We are actually in a very inner circle where we understand what's going on. We are on the very forefront, but we should not forget there are so many people out there who have other things to do than talk about interoperability, uh, talk about data formats, talk about provenance. Um, we shouldn't forget about them. Really take the time, talk with the people, educate them, but also not someone, uh, a university professor talking down <laughs> to some other people, but it needs to be really on eye level. Um, and this brings me to the last point I want to stress uh, on this round table, as this is also identity. Uh, we had this kind of a fun persona when we developed our solution where we said, okay, what would be if I walk naked into an airport? Would it be possible that I uh, kind of provide credentials that I was vaccinated, that I have uh, some kind of information? And we looked into uh, biometric identification, iris scans, maybe uh, uh, fingerprints and so on. How can we actually link the information to biometric features of a human two credentials and really also use this in a privacy preserving way. This is a very interesting topic. Uh, I mean, we see it to a lesser extent right now with Amazon supermarkets. You can go in, you just take things and walk out again. So this is something that I think 10, 15 years ago, uh, we didn't think it was possible. Maybe it is possible in five to 10 years that we just walk through an airport and through biometric features, it's just possible for us uh, because we are identified, but in a human-centric, uh, privacy-preserving way that our data is just used for things that we have agreed before to, but we don't need to carry with us our yellow passports, phones, uh, tickets, and so on. So I think there could be a bright future, quite a lot of technical challenges ahead. I think the technology is almost there yet, uh, but it could be that everybody is using it in a very non-invasive way. Okay, a few thoughts. thoughts. I don't know <laughs> how much time I Great. have used. If there are yeah, more yeah, questions, yeah. happy to discuss afterwards. Excellent. That was exactly five minutes. Awesome. Um, so yeah, next up, I'd like to uh, give the floor to uh, Ben DeBaster from iMac and the Pro for IT Data. 
project which you presented uh, uh, the previous hour and uh, expanding on your previous presentation what do you think about uh, usability in the context of um, uh, of data portability and I'm also um, interested in uh, maybe developer experience where if you see your project as a building block uh, what is the experience of a developer that wants to build something on without being on a closed proprietary platform uh, yeah thanks so um, yeah so we created property data to um, really increase uh, reuse of data so pushing it into into the solid pot but with with the idea in mind that that there's no such thing as the only way to make data interoperable there's no one unifying model or format um, in which every application in the world will be able to to work with um, we, i mean we already see it with with calendars there's there's this there's i call and then everybody puts a flavor on top um, because it's just from an application standpoint almost impossible to only use the the, the common denominators but then from user point of view so we we, we kind of solved that to have this kind of like one click uh, move your data around um, and you can choose whatever data model that you want but there's there's a big trade-off there because then you actually assume that either the user or the application builder uh, that, that that wants to uh, make use of interoperable data actually um, knows which data model he wants he or she wants to use um, so that's that that's that's i think something that makes um decentralized applications um or like what, what you were calling like federation like different applications using the same kind of data um makes it uh, quite hard for um more complex uh, use cases um, and i think once we see this user port portability getting more and more traction um we'll start uh, hitting those kinds of borders like we need to um build um common um uh, uh, common descriptions we we need to discuss exactly what are like the common denominators not just for calendars but what about energy consumption like one of the other projects um what about health what about vaccination data the the you can always use a model, a standard, um, but it's very hard, I think, for any application to just adhere to the same same kind of model. And that um, that also makes it harder for, for users um, and for us users that are more like application builders um, to create best practice applications because you can only do that once you know what the best practice models are and that's this kind of um catch 22 where we're in right now there there are no applications because there are no there are no models and there are no models because there are no applications um so um i mean that's that's that, that's my my take on it and we uh, conveniently um um bypassed that problem by just giving the choice um but that doesn't necessarily help in usability it helps in functionality uh but doesn't help in, in, in usability per se um so so yeah that's um that's a, a, yeah a, a, a tricky thing which also isn't um easy to solve because it's not a technical problem it's a community problem or a um uh, yeah i would say social problem i mean what kind of features do you want um and don't you want what kind of data do you need and don't you need um is uh harder to solve in a community point of view than in a technical point of view cool thanks a lot uh so uh next up i'd like to ask uh, uh either philip uh or shabati uh Benna from uh grid pockets uh oratorio project uh to uh build on the previous presentation in the context of uh usability and uh yeah i'm very very interested in um the uh so these added services for energy providers make people want to stay with their current provider because they have so so such nice insights in their energy users such nice integrations uh 
with their uh, car charger. Um, and um, at, uh, so it's, uh, I think there's an interesting interplay there between making everything very open and portable, but at the same time, uh, using that extra value to retain customers uh, as an energy provider. Um, uh, so yeah, you choose either Philip or uh, Jean-Baptiste. Thanks, uh, Michel, for the question. Um, I think, yeah, there is this paradox, and I will come back to this in a, in a moment, but uh, I think we have a the bigger problem to solve, which is uh, the energy transition towards cleaner energy and more efficient usages. So for us, as a company, this is the objective number one. And a lot of investment has been made around the world to make the electric and gas networks smarter and collect data. But at the end of the day, the level of usage of this data is, is very low. The, the studies show that uh, half of the people have difficulties to read the charts when you show, for example, your energy consumption on the chart. And then uh, two thirds of people, they don't understand what they can gain from this. And 90% uh, of people don't feel really involved and implicated in the energy savings. So this is why we have decided that the data usability, the, the, the UX and the usability is a key factor to make this, uh, those system work and make the get value from the data. Now, um, of course, to make uh, this work, you need to get people engaged. And this is what we do at Grid Pocket. But also what you need is to have a, an open ecosystem where companies, researchers can compete for even more engaging, even smarter way of presenting and analyzing data. And this is what we want to achieve through data portability. We want to get more people on board so there is a more attractive and more clear offer for uh, for the end users and we believe that this will drive actually the competitiveness of the market and utilities who are leaders in providing uh, the ecosystem with them of solutions they will be the leaders of the future of course once you open up you take the risk because maybe this added value of analyzing data or holding data with you i mean you don't control it anymore but uh, i don't believe in the future world where companies will be controlling things all the time all of our data i mean this is at least not the the, the vision that we are working and building uh, we are fighting for the world where uh, data will be owned by people who should own them and which can be easily shared of course with the consumer consent and in this perspective we want our customers our utility partners to to lead this uh, this way um jean baptiste maybe you want to complete uh, from from your more research related perspective sure so i guess you you said most of the the things i think the energy sector is very interesting uh, because we are at the beginning of the digitalization. We just uh, got so many data recently. And the energy providers, they did not really have time to, to develop all the, the possible functions and, uh, and tools that could use this data and, uh, and to show them, to show the users, the, the end users, how much it could be, uh, it could be useful. So, um, the usability of all this has not really been perceived by uh, by all the end users by uh, by now, and uh, and that's a problem, and uh, that's why we think that portability uh, towards all these different uh, ser services that are not available now uh, is somewhere the the key. We so, uh, yeah. and we know that. Sorry. Yeah, just finish just to say that uh, the the users it's it's useful because the users they they don't really know about all these uh, services, and also there are all these uh, technical limitations about what needs to be exported and in the, which format, uh, and that's a problem for the users and that's also a problem for the for the third parties that offer the service because they don't really need what kind of data they. Uh, how they need to translate this data so they can make them uh, useful. So, Philippe, you, you want yeah, to? Thanks. Uh, so, yeah, to resume, what we want to do is to empower the consumers. Empower in one way that they can 
feel that they have data portability, that they have a choice, they can switch the service providers, utility, whoever. At the same time, we want them to be truly aware of uh, those choices and of uh, the fact also that they don't have necessarily to follow the first uh, advertising campaign on the TV or somebody who is calling them and pretending that they can get a better electricity from somebody else. We want them to, to get a more understanding of where they are and then to do just the, the better, more uh, educated choices. Great, thanks a lot. Uh, so uh, the last one I'd like to invite uh, Hans-Jörg Happel from uh, Audrika and the uh, Open Export Project to say a bit about building on your earlier pitch uh, regarding um, usability and um, yeah, the usability of importing, the migrating, as you say, data into a new tool. And I understand you'd uh, share your screen for this. Yeah, in part, I'll do. Thanks, Michel. Um, I, I like your uh, initial statement about the seamless switch. Yeah? So if we dream, I mean, what would be uh, the awesome thing would be really where by your fingertips to switch the provider, right? And um, I will argue a little bit like this whole data portability thing, I think we are here on an infinite and on a piecemeal journey, actually, yeah? because we won't solve this completely anytime soon. I think all my uh, previous uh, co-speakers have uh, made that clear. And um, I, I think from two dimensions, this is the point. So one point is the domain. Yeah? So we have been learned now, I think Philip told like, you know, in the energy sector, it's not even clear what does what the user supposed to switch even expect, right? It's not a commodity yet. Yeah? Um, and this also goes a little bit into Brian's argument, like, um, yeah. you know, for many data types, you might not even be um, sure uh, how to reach consensus. Yeah? And we, we are in a, in a yeah, domain where- Yeah, going behind the scenes and he, hey, right? Natalie. Okay, I have some voice here in me. <laughs> can you still hear me, everybody? Sorry? Okay. Yes, we can hear you. It's going good. Hear you. Yeah, yeah, no. yeah, okay, because there's there problems. Some interruption and, uh, I cannot see by my Most of the problems, anymore. you know, like we get the email, hey, I cannot access with, you know, I cannot access with Skype, and wait, he's in the meeting. That's for the I think mute, there is somebody Sorry. speaking in between. <laughs> classics, definitely classics. Can, anyway. Sorry, can, can you please mute? Excuse me, I think it's a technical support account. I don't know. Yes, I think it was fixed. We can hear you now. Okay, thanks. <laughs> okay. I felt I was speechless for real. He, he was so uh, sweet. I got so, uh, like, the words of gratitude, yeah, sorry, especially coming from him. Very... I mean, he, he really impressed me. <laughs> he really impressed me. So, when you read it, Abdul, can you please mute? mute. Oh we my. can all hear you. <laughs> okay, so okay, I. I I will continue. So piecemeal from a sense of, uh, of the domain, um, but the main point I want to make also piecemeal um, from the perspective of what picture in the process is there in terms of seamless switching, because only the uh, copying the data is just part of it. And um, that's actually what we do right now. So I, sh I hope you can see my screen where you see um, our migration application. So you can select, I want to go from iCloud to Gmail or something like that. And um, yeah, then you enter your credentials and you do the actual migration. So, but what do people struggle in here? Yeah, so what, what is the kind of people that come to us? I mean, actually we are very proud. A lot of even non-technical skilled people are able to manage this process, but still, if you look beyond, it's still kind of technical. I mean, what needs to be clarified before you can really proceed here is you need to have a contract in place. Yeah? So in terms of portability, ideally you might even want to switch or share your contract identity, your address, your bank account, these kind of things when signing up for the new service. Um, in, in the particular uh, case of email here, it's a provisioning thing, right? So you have your um, Apple iCloud account um, and if you need to create an account in Gmail, so not just the contract, but also the physical account, maybe with some features enabled, some settings, this kind of stuff. This even needs to be done just before starting here, right? And we have some people struggling with that. And there's no way really to uh, do that because not all of this stuff can be done by APIs. Um, then you might run into quota problems, right? So um, even if you were, were so smart to check if your new Gmail account can take all the data from the Apple account in terms of total size, like two gigabytes, um, Gmail might still have limitations for individual items. Like I think Gmail for a long time had a 25 megabyte attachment limit. I think it's now 50 megabytes. Um, but still, yeah, that's not standardized nowhere. Uh, there is, uh, in all the IMAP RSDs, there is no such, um, um, it's not dealt with. Yeah? 
Um, then there is the address. Yeah? So if you come from a free mail provider, you cannot actually take your iCloud email address with you. And that's the question people ask us. Yeah? So what's there in number portability? Um, it doesn't work for email uh, portability, at least if you don't own your own domain name. Uh, and um, yeah, it's not technically really feasible right now. I mean, it would be technically feasible, but with the cooperation of Apple only. So maybe we need, first of all, standards, but also a law here for this kind of aspect. Yeah? Um, and then if you have done all this, yeah, what about the client configuration stuff? Yeah, you might even have some data on your client, like on your Outlook. Yeah? Not all the data might be on the, uh, on the provider server. You might too have to configure your email client. Uh, different email clients, like your mobile email client, your desktop email client, uh, might use different folders for your deleted emails, and so on and so on. Um, and you see all these kind of things are obstacles in a way. Um, and um, yeah, that's maybe from, from a journey perspective. And even before, yeah, um, as I said before, it needs to be a commodity. So you need to have in mind um, what is the feature set of the thing you switch to. And the interesting thing is, even if you would say like um, a group fair system is sort of standardized, uh, we have experienced people switching to another product and they were not satisfied with the calendar display yeah, because it didn't work so well for them anymore to display multiple events on a day or something like that which is why we have a test function here. Yeah? So you can do a test migration and then check out the destination system. But obviously there is no, nobody really forcing a vendor, a destination vendor to uh, put this into place. Um, and uh, maybe a, a final point, um, which I think also is important in terms of usability in a wider sense is that we can act here as an intermediary. So we are not the destination provider, we are not the source provider, but we can also give some oversight consulting to people and, and answer them questions um, about the actual migration or portability thing. And um, uh, also the providers we cooperate with often uh, divert people to us in order to answer these very specific portability questions they have in mind um, in order to make their switch seamless. Um, and I think this also is an aspect um, for practical implementation of the whole thing that um, it's maybe worth thinking a little bit more about it. I think I could talk for hours, but uh, I think that was good for an uh, introduction. Awesome. Here. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot. So thanks a lot, uh, all, all four panelists, for these uh, for these pitches. Uh, I have a few discussion questions, and then after that, we'll have the open uh, Q and A, and then uh, uh, that'll be a break before the next uh, panel. So my first question is. Um, should we empower users so much by, ex by explaining to them what vCard is so that they know um, that they can, okay, I can see, I have the vCard so I know I own my data, or should we make uh, data portability so use usable that users do not need to know what these formats are? Um, uh, yeah, so regarding data formats, is that something that uh, understanding data formats is part of education, which users, uh, which empowers users, or um, should it all be uh, magic to them? Um, if I may jump in, I don't know if anybody else wants. Uh, <laughs> um, I would say it depends on the user. So certainly, I think uh, for for a lot of users, that's very useful uh, to know because they, you know, they're experts. They know to, maybe how to proceed with three cards, something like that. But if you look at the real average math user, I don't think that. Um, but I think actually data literacy in the terms of knowing there is some data portability option is a thing. Yeah? So we experience a lot when we discuss with our hosting partners about how to advertise even the migration service. It's, it's really tricky because the onboarding journey for a customer is strictly quite short. And um, we, we, we have quite some discussions with, with hosts about the touch points, yeah? like in a welcome email, for instance, or within the webmailer, yeah? to make them aware that this possibility even of an import exists. Yeah? Uh, because typically, if you also look at some people offering uh, GDPR Article 20 stuff, it's really buried somewhere in the documentation or in the settings, like a, a tab somewhere, buried somewhere. Um, and um, yeah, so certainly, there needs to be also a new communication about this, yeah? because I think many people are not really aware of that. Yeah? The ones that have a little bit of a technical knowledge might be triggered by something like VCAR or might search actively for something like that. Uh, but I think that won't work or won't scale for the average user. Awesome. Uh, thank you. Uh, so my other question um, would be, 
so we, we are trying to make the web more open and things that are open are uh, sometimes a bit like even anarchistic and, um, uh, and there'll be m multiple options for anything because it's open and, and everybody has uh, an op can add more options. So there'll, there'll be a lot of choice, uh, for instance, for data formats. Um, and um, that would, you could see that as the more uh, options there are for a user, um, or they need to be aware that they have, for instance, a different, they have a choice of where their data is stored or they have a choice to consent to something or not. And um, they have a choice to switch to different providers um, and they have a choice to choose a data format, etc. cetera. Um, so would that be, uh, would, there, would the openness that we're trying to build automatically make uh, the web we are building harder to use than um, a platform? And is there anything we can do against that? I don't think that it's necessarily um, hard or that it becomes, but actually I think it's uh, even necessary that we really uh, define interfaces, that we define standards uh, to get to a truly open uh, system. I mean, we see it a little bit with email, uh, also with other solutions, and this is actually what we uh, really put a big focus on in the digital immunization passport project that we said, what are the logical components? And I think um, it's necessary that each of the components that there are multiple solutions, this is also kind of the freedom of people to choose what they like best. I think there shouldn't be just a single thing and that uh, can solve everything. Uh, we have a pluralistic uh, society and people like want to know all the nitty gritties and configure everything, but others just say, okay, give me something as simple as possible. So uh, I strongly believe uh, that it should be open and that we develop it further. I can maybe just add that I think the usability factor is, is essential. We have seen so many good standards, good initiative uh, fail comparing to the big platforms because they are not as, as usable. You know, in car industry, you have standards which enables to connect your smartphone to your car. And all of the users, they prefer the proprietary solutions rather than standardized one because they are just easier to use and you can find uh, a lot of examples like this so um, overall i think there is no uh, no much choice and this is the whole challenge for the portability uh, how to make it easy for customers and i think this is what many of the projects here in, in oratorio were were trying to achieve to, to simplify this uh, portability process Awesome. Uh, we're gonna uh, invite questions from Great. the audience. Okay. Oh, sorry. No, no, go ahead. Uh, I don't want to interrupt your question from the audience. Otherwise, I can I have some two or three cents to it. <laughs> so, uh, just interrupt me if there is a question. So, um, uh, yeah, what what I think in terms of the heterogeneity thing, just an observation, maybe also from the history of what we have seen so far, like in task management systems, group based systems, and so on. Um, I, I think there is sort of faces like you know there is heterogeneity raising but there is also streamlining in a way yeah? because uh, products converge um, also new products in a way try to be compatible with existing products um, the more a certain uh, software converges and i think one also has to think about data portability not in a perfect way like every each piece of data can be migrated so even in a in a group where a sense there might be stuff you have in gmail um, or in google uh, you cannot transfer easily to Office 365 seamlessly. But people typically, when, and this is again a usability issue, uh, if there is an informed choice like this and that kind of data won't be able to, uh, uh, you know, be transferred, um, people are often fine in that case because especially very arcane and non-standard stuff, uh, not so many people use that. And there might be ways of, um, you know, losing that or, you know, transferring that into some other format. Uh, so, so splitting actually between the actual new destination and maybe archiving or, um, uh, you know, into another application, maybe into two applications is also an interesting usability question at the end, I think. Well, yeah, there's, uh, I, um, 
I think I don't see any um, raised at the um, any people who raised their hands with the raise hand function. If you have a question, but there were um, two really two um, uh, questions already written into the chat. Uh, the first one was from um, Paul Olivier de A. Uh, what type of business models do you foresee around very open standards and giving control of their data back to users? Well, a few comments maybe from my side to the business questions. Uh, currently, I think we are still in the Wild West um, where we are with a new data economy. We have seen a Google, a Facebook who have built uh, successful businesses. I see now that we are now somehow um, actually developing in more mature markets that it's not just only of benefiting of personal data, uh, but hopefully really uh, solutions uh, will come to the market that benefit not only just a few who get rich, uh, but uh, distributes this uh, much more. And I uh, really want to mention here also uh, the my data approach uh, that there should be actually a human centric way, uh, not a company centric way, uh, how to approach this. But what exactly those business models are, I think this is still a few years ahead that we have this broad established data economy. So for uh, market readiness level, I think we are in very low numbers. But this is just my view. Would be also interested to hear the others. Cool. Um, and uh, yeah, we have to, uh, we've only got two minutes left. So there was another question from Daniel about 5G. Do you expect 5G and speculatively 6G to have a significant impact on portability, post platform, web, etc. And then uh, Philip Page added that, uh, yeah, we have to solve for the privacy and consent issue uh, before 5G matures with um, uh, IoT outnumbering humans on the networks. Uh, so who wants to say something about it? I would say that 5G gives uh, universal data access everywhere. So I think it gives a new common denominator for many services. And so I can think already in our space how it could simplify many technical procedures. So to lower the barriers to data portability and, uh, and simplify deployment of, of new services. So I think uh, uh, it's there is no one particular way, but overall, it will have a very positive impact in the in the way a system will interconnect together. Cool. Well, that that's a very uh, very positive note to end on, I think, uh, and I'm really excited to see uh, all the Dopsy projects and um, the usable portability that we're all building. Um, uh, so uh, thank you lots for the, all the panelists. Um, we are going to take a 15 minute break before the next panel, which will be about uh, scalability. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, everybody. See you in 15 minutes. About the technology transfer and uh, scaling up uh, issues. So I am Bertrand Lejeune uh, from uh, Cap Digital. And uh, in fact, I'm in charge of uh, the community uh, of techno providers. I'm very pleased um, to welcome free entrepreneurs, Lloyd from uh, DAPSI program. Uh, so I let the floor to them. Um, oops, I am mute. Am I mute? Okay. No, no, we can hear you. We can hear you. No, it's okay. Yeah, it's okay. fine. Yeah. Okay, it's fine. So. I was slacked as being muted, but I'm not. Okay, so I'm very pleased to uh, welcome uh, for this roundtable number two, um, uh, three entrepreneurs. Um, so namely, uh, Mehdi, Alejandro, and Tom. So I'll let you introduce yourselves, guys, in uh, one minute or so uh, to tell us uh, who you are, 
uh, what is your com company about? Why are you so passionate about that data, uh, data privacy and data portability? Uh, and uh, why, in a few words, even if you pitch before, uh, why you think you're going to be a game changer? Floor is yours, guys. All right. So who wants to start? Yeah. I can so, start. Yeah. Okay. I can, I can start. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks or not, Bertrand. So I'm uh, Alejandro Russo. I'm a co founder of Dipella, uh, which is a company uh, that enables. Uh, to perform analytics on personal data without violating the privacy of people. And uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm not only the co-founder of the Pella, I'm professor in computer science at the Chalmers University and Gothenburg University, uh, both located in Gothenburg in Sweden. Um, yeah, and I'm passionate about uh, data privacy because I believe we, we are getting into an era where like never before uh, data that has been generated based on the behavior of individuals or uh, citizens or customers is being collected at a massive scale. And of course, all the data... We are collecting data at a massive scale and uh, we need to kind of, uh, to, to fully exploit that data, we need a way to, to mine data insight from it but without violating the privacy of our citizen or our customers. And that's not an easy problem. Uh, it's quite tricky actually. And that's why, you know, my background from academia can help uh, uh, to, to solve this problem. Uh, yeah, and I think we are going to be a game changer because it's kind of a, a new technology uh, based on academic research. And, you know, there are not many people in the world that can master it at the level of the, the developing a product. Hi, I'm Tom Hagemans, uh, co-founder and uh, research lead of Digita. Uh, we build software so organizations can get started with a solid specification. I'm uh, passionate about data portability because I believe people should be able to easily share information without concerns. Uh, I think data portability, better data portability will be a game changer because it will enable more business uh, competition, more privacy and also a better user experience. Okay, Mehdi. Yep, on my side, uh, my name is Mehdi. Uh, I'm, a, let's say, a, a APIs and portability advocate over the last 10 years uh, to promote like a, a better data sharing, uh, respecting uh, people's privacy, but also respecting people's incentives, because I think it will make a, a world of more equal opportunities of entrepreneurship or being able to be a full citizen uh, by having uh, the knowledge of data. For that, I've done two things. Uh, the first one, uh, I've done um, uh, a conference called API Days uh, that, that promotes the use of APIs and portability across the world. And, uh, and currently I'm the founder uh, of Alias, a company that makes GDPR programmable because we believe that unless not only the, 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 the data protection officers, but also the developers who implement privacy solution are able to do it, we will not have neither portability, neither privacy. Okay, thank you guys. Um, well, I would like to um, raise the first question uh, about um, uh, the required conditions for technology transfer. So as you all know, um, if we take uh, the example of Gaia X, uh, Gaia X was mentioned earlier on during the session of day. You know that Gaia X aims at creating the conditions to scale up European data spaces. Um, so it's really data oriented, even if it's, uh, it came from uh, the cloud industry, uh, with a set of policy rules and technical certification about cloud portability and interoperability. And uh, as far as we know, but it's changing almost every day, you know, uh, the proposed framework for techno providers uh, is the concept of open source contribution from all members, whoever they are, labs, startups, corporates. And uh, this proposal of uh, opening, you know, the source, uh, as a contribution to belong to, to, belong to uh, this uh, ecosystem is raising a lot of questions for the startups in terms of technology transfer. And you are startups, so um, so I would like to raise this question to you, guys. Uh, what would be the required conditions 
from your standpoint for technology transfer to disseminate your technologies still while making the most of your assets without you know uh, losing your assets so who wants to start with that question Tom, I think, maybe. yeah Tom, i think open ahead. source is uh, is in, is important indeed but also i think open standards because it's uh, the topic is data portability so it's important that uh, of course you can uh, have portability by by uh, by your your the companies that you you rely on um, implement the same open standards uh, and also i think a community the community of of those companies the coalition of the willing uh, and even startups uh, and, and and companies that are uh, that that are really uh, working towards data portability so i think open source but also open standards and also a community of, of like-minded uh, companies or organizations On my side, I would say uh, uh, three things are truly are needed, and by order of importance, I would begin by incentives. I really think we need to find the use cases, we need to find the user experiences where data portability is a game changer to align incentive of, of the user, incentive of, of the person receiving the data, and the incentive of also the person uh, like sending the data, at least incentive or fear of the regulation, right? So, so like this. So that's the first need we need to have to scale technology transfer because it's not only about technology; it's about use case. It's about you know uh, 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 incentives like economical and and design incentive. The second thing is um, uh, the second thing is to align with the regulation. To, to that the regulation does not impose or does not provide uh, 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 um, uh, let's say insights about the technology to use. It's on purpose, but many, many companies use that as a way to not comply because they say it's not written as is a technology, so we don't have to decide a technology, right? Uh, and, and they avoid the, at least the portability uh, obligation. So the regulation needs to be stronger on how to do it. And then last but not least, this is about open technology, open source, open standard, open design, because to really scale, it has to be this way. But in my, in my idea, it's first incentive on the UX and and um, and uh, and user um, user design and user experience and user cases, um, then it's the regulation has to push in that direction with giving insight about technologies, and then it's how the technology is made really open. Okay, interesting. Alejandro, what is your opinion on that? So just to complement uh, what what the my colleagues say. Um, yeah, I think like uh, having open APIs like uh, or standard APIs with the standard data models will will kind of facilitate that that way. Uh, of course, open source is 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 uh, super nice, but uh, for example, in my company, I, I don't I, you know uh, at this stage maybe because we are too early, uh, we are not that willing to do an open uh, you know to go open source. Maybe you know in the future when we grow the the source code base. Then we can identify what parts can be uh, uh, published to generate the community uh, synergy. But at the moment, uh, I, I don't see that as an option uh, without losing the assets and you know uh, losing the business model. Uh, but of course, um, having a clear standard API with clear data models, I think that will be super valuable for everyone to start using the services. And um, yeah, and. For example, in our case, I started uh, generating uh, safe analytics. That's it. Okay. Uh, does someone want to uh, add something before we switch um, to the second question? You know, te te technology transfer. I mean, um, um, you are you are startup, so it's clearly at the core of your uh, of the valuation of your campaign. Um, so, um, technology can be transferred, but uh, within rules and the market dynamics, which uh, are meaningful for the development of your company. So, um, um, so you you you've been introducing the I would say the, um, the ideas of you know um, um, how to scale. I mean, it's it's linked to the scaling up of your activities. You know, you can transfer technology as fast. You can scale up in a safe way. Um, so we know that, uh, so I'm switching to a second question, which is pretty consistent with the first one. 
so we know we all know that from uh, we are about new generation of internet right agi uh, so we know that long tail internet engagement is based on the singular or specific drivers such as frictionless user experience you mentioned uh, you touched that point of user experience uh, aggressive business models so um, how can you value data data uh, data uh, data data portability and sharing a robustness of implementation and operational quality of service um, so it's a mix of good practices which means that you switch from uh, early adopters a few early adopters to long tail huge engaged uh, users right uh, and customers um, and the hyperscalers we know them gafam to mention them are excellent at delivering such a unique experience for their platforms to remain at the center of a data value chain they really reintermediate value uh, with the data as a core asset uh, through their platform so so my question would be back to you would be uh, how would you convert small numbers because today uh, data sharing, I mean, uh, with new technologies and new protocols are confidential, so numbers. So how would you convert small numbers in massive adoption and engagement from users and uh, owners of personal data uh, for with new emerge, with, I mean, with uh, such new emerging data portability propositions? What would be your top two or top three recommendations on that? Who wants to start? To be honest, um, I, I don't think users uh, should have to decide whether to adopt data portability technology. I think it's not up to the users. I think organizations should drive user engagement. Uh, and there are several organizations that have an incentive to, to do so. I mean, imagine if your government suddenly allows you to easily port or reuse uh, your governmental data, for example, to apply for a home loan. That's data portability, right? I think user adoption should be driven by, by organizational adoption. I think several organizations yeah. like governments have a good incentive uh, to do so, for example, to increase voter satisfaction. So I think uh, that's one way to do it. Okay. Okay. Who else wants to answer to that question? Maybe? Yeah. Or... Let's say... Um... <laughs> It's a, it's a difficult question um, because let's say the one who have won the first battle, you know, the big the GAFAM and others actually have been successful because they were not, they were able to keep the data for themselves. You know, mm -hmm. monetization of data is not about selling the data, it's about keeping it for you and monetizing, making better decisions. And over time with a compound interest, your best, your best, uh, when you make best decisions, at the end, you take a, you, you, there is a huge gap between you and competition. So actually, this is what they, they do. Because it was not portable, they were able to keep it to be as big as they are. So for me, the only solution, but again, we are here, three entrepreneurs trying to do it, is to build another one, a billion dollar user, a billion dollar user, billion users, sorry, a billion dollar company, but billion users, who will have this, you know, idea that yes, things should be portable things and will enable to, uh, to share data with others. But the problem is that a lot of people, and I am and we are, who thinks portability is great and transparency is great and openness is great, we, didn't, we are not at the, at the head of billion, billion users, company and application to really make it happen. So there is an in-between, of course, at least our in-between, we believe that the one implementing privacy are the developers. Developers are inside the companies. Developers are really a scarce resource. So if we raise the mindset in the developer community that yeah, privacy should is easy, portability is easy to implement. They will be the voice inside even big corporations say, look, yeah, we have to do it. First, it's the law. Second, it's what we want to do. Else we go elsewhere. So we think this is the, the community that has the power. And when they will have the tools, they will be able to promote it inside companies and fight against top management. This is our opinion. Alejandro? Yeah, so um, I can tell you a little bit of the experience that we have uh, talking with companies about, uh, you know, uh, trying to apply our technology to the, you know, making analytics. They are super concerned. They don't want to share data at all. They don't want to move the data anywhere. They wanted to keep it to themselves. And uh, it takes a lot of effort to show them, like, uh, you know, um, you can actually move the data in a secure way. You know, if you make it private, then you can, uh, sorry, if you protect the privacy, then you can move it 
beyond your infrastructure and so on and benefit the users and, and everyone by you know communicating data insights but it's super hard it's still everyone is, is super scared so what is our, what i think is like the plan for like uh, going to massive numbers it's like my my approach my humble approach is like by niches right so if you go and you know one smart city company collects a lot of data about how people move around and so on you show them that you know, the technology to make privacy to, to make pri private analytics works and they can benefit from that then it's much easier to go to the next smart city company and convince them about that uh, the, the same if you know you take another segment like we are doing with health you know biotech companies you do that and then you go to the next one so for me it's like you know targeting different domains which are the most likely to be open to uh, move data around uh, and then from there have really good cases uh, as, as a company and then show that uh, look this is possible because i think there's a lot of um, concern uh, when we talk about sensitive data uh, companies are currently in our experience talking with many of them are super concerned they don't want the data to go anywhere essentially yeah. mm. okay so in fact you you mentioned we are a bit ahead of time so we can uh, can remain a little bit on that uh, second topic before we switched, uh, we move to, to the third and last one. Um, okay, so I meant not that um, you have three, three ideas or three proposals. First one is, of course, to start with the public adoption. So public uh, bodies should show the example and should one way or the other use such uh, data portability uh, technologies in order to ease uh, the data access to, uh, to to public public data. I'm not saying only open data, but also to free non-open data uh, in um, but uh, public uh, non-open public data, which uh, brings more data than pure open data. Right. Uh, the second idea that you mentioned was that uh, okay, if there is I would say friction, I mean uh, uh, massive adoption and engagement of developers uh, communities um, thanks to frictionless use of uh, data portability, portability tools it will help it will support education of the organizations and it will facilitate i would say the, uh, the dissemination of uh, uh, data portability techno uh, uh, technical solutions um, so that, <clears throat> that was the second idea, and the third, third one was about around the, B2, the B2C versus B2B, if I understood well, Alejandro. And I have a short comment on that. Uh, B2B, we can see the emergence, uh, for instance, from GaiaX. Uh, some, you know, uh, European players, they specialize on uh, data sharing platforms, you know. Uh, for B2B only, not B2C, huh? B2B. Um, so we have, uh, we have comp European companies uh, who created a new business of uh, platformization. So how you drive data sharing with the business models, with your right architecture, with the right policy and governance rules uh, from the stakeholders joining such platforms, right? Which are uh, white label platforms. So we are talking about uh, uh, platforms out of a shelf. Uh, to uh, facilitate the data sharing um, um, in a very, I would say, horizontal way for any kind of uh, domain. Uh, and so you have such stakeholders who are ramping up, scaling up now. And so B2B uh, is an interesting, um, so, very, very, so I, I would guess that such, such stakeholders would be very interested in being kept aware of new, uh, new technologies uh, facilitating or easing the data portability because it's all about so Gaia X I think is a is a is a nice uh, I would say uh, benchmark to take when we are a startup uh, to see uh, to see how to uh, to make uh, your technologies uh, visible within the ecosystem and it's free you can you can you can you can go there you can register you can be a member uh, again. Be careful about the open source. They are working on that, so be careful about the open source. Okay, so I would like to switch to, we are, yes, we are two minutes ahead of time, so we are fine. I'd like to, um, to go even deeper, you know, to the incentives. You mentioned incentives. So, you know, data uh, has, I mean, data in itself doesn't have value. I'm not 
saying so, something very clever here, smart. I'm just saying that data is you can it's like black oil, you know, uh, rough oil. But uh, what you can do with data brings a lot of value. And so you need data to uh, to bring to bring value to uh, to uh, to, um, uh, to 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 the market. Um, so as mentioned before, so as part of a major incentive, of course, business modeling. I mean, how the revenue models, attractive revenue models, uh, might be key. This I don't know, but maybe key to boost engagement. Um, so uh, you know that already several apps propose to sell uh, your, da your, uh, your data for cash, as an example. Uh, there, are, there, there, are, there are quite a, quite a significant number of initiatives. Uh, so they are uh, upfront to the users, or to, I mean to, to, to the users of the data users, but also uh, the data owners, right? Um, so my question would be, does it make sense to, to monetize personal B2C data one way or the other to scale up data portability? And if yes, how would you, as techno providers, would you uh, see it um, in a positive way or is it a bad idea? Who wants to start with that question? To be Tom. honest, I don't really yeah. like the idea of uh, data monetization and mostly for two reasons. So first, I think the value of personal data is way smaller than you might think. So let's take, for example, a data brokerage company called Biznote. Uh, they currently sell personal data for marketing purposes. But if you take a look at their turnover, uh, yearly turnover, and divide it by the number of people, uh, the data that they sell about, uh, it's not that big of a number. It's, it's like two euros a year. We also have a company in Belgium, it's called Cake, and they, they do data monetization. And here with, with Cake, the app, you as a person, you get like one euro a month for selling your data and second even if you if you even if you would earn more as a person i wouldn't like really a situation where less fortunate people would be forced to sell their data because of financial reasons not only because of moral obligations but also because yeah if you capture as a company the data about this population this this population of more less less fortunate people yeah of course, that data can be extrapolated to other populations as well, probably, resulting in the exact same situation as we are in now, uh, meaning targeted advertisements uh, based upon preferences and so on. So I don't think data monetization would be a good idea. On my okay. side, in the, in the GDPR portability report we published last week, we demonstrate that the value of the data is not, as we say, the one you sell, it's the one you keep to make better decisions. Just an example, um, a, a query about uh, uh, reimbursing loans on Google can be sold like 50 to $100 per click, right? Because they know actually the context that you are, uh, uh, that you are uh, in, a, in the process of uh, trying to reimburse a loan and, and mortgage and stuff like that. But just the query in text, in JSON or whatever machine readable format, like, you know, like just a string of character which is the data where you did it, the time you did it, as long as it's not like completely shared and, 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 uh, and let's say uh, completely real time shared with others, the, the value is kept for Google, just an example, right? So it's not the data directly as we say, it, but it's keeping it that make it, that make it the value. So again, I think data monetization are weak business, data monetization, direct monetization and selling are weak business models. The best business model is about keeping it and portability goes against that. So we think the only way, you know, because you were talking about Gaia X, which is really controversial, personally make, making tech conferences over the last 10 years, uh, standard doesn't work anymore as much as before. It's de facto standards that people adopt. Uh, you know, the, the uh, chief of growth at Facebook used to say that it's not the best who wins, it's the one everybody use. And I think we are in an era right now, who even like Tim Berners-Lee pushing solid doesn't have massive adoption even if he's the founder of the web, because it's de facto standard. So even Gaia X, which is really top down, this is not the reality of today. So we, we need to make it from the ground up, from the bottom up. And in that, data, direct data monetization and business models, I think are really weak business models. They're really weak. And uh, uh, yeah, we are trying to find solutions here. But I think, yeah, this is really not the way to go because it will show it, it's a failure. It will show that data, whatever economy is a failure, and we will steep we will still give the, all the value for the one keeping all the data. Okay, thank you. Right, so 
Yeah, so I, ha I have a little bit of a different experience. Uh, so, you know, when we talk to companies, uh, some companies, they told us that they're spending so much money in collecting data that they would like to amortize those costs, right? So, and that's why they were looking into a way to explore the data in a safe manner while respecting the privacy. Uh, so actually, they we, we talked to at least two companies that they were looking for data monetization, but it's not from the customer, right? It's not the, the C. It's just a B2B monetization. And that seems to make a little bit more sense um, for, for companies to amortize the data collection costs. Um, now, when it, comes, when it comes to the customer, as Tom was saying, like, you know, I'm selling my data, but I, you know, the, it doesn't worth that much. Uh, and I agree with that because it's not, uh, it's not like one piece of data that worth, it's like the collection of data that allow me to identify a trend in the behavior that actually is valuable. It's not only one individual. So from the one individual perspective, I believe that it's not, it will not be super valuable, but it's like when you can identify trends, when you collect data from many, many individuals, that's why the data insight becomes super valuable. As uh, Mehdi was saying, like you keep the data, then you can have a lot of insights and exploit that. Uh, so uh, yeah, from the customer, you know, monetize data doesn't make sense from the business perspective. I think it makes sense and it will, I believe it will make more and more sense the more we move into a data-driven society. But if I may, there is a great paper from Noam Kolk. He's a lawyer and researcher on data called Return on Data. And he shows that, let's say, at the end, people will accept to share data against the free service as long as their estimation of the value of their data is lower than the value of the service they get. Right, so simple stuff. If I use Facebook for free, I consider the data they have on me is uh, uh, is value less the the fact I have a free service. Of course, there are biases. Maybe I don't know exactly what they do with my data, which is the 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 bias here. But at least you know it's simple stuff, and this is why so many people care about data because they have free services, right? And at the end, this is how it works. So we need also to raise the 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 mindset that yeah, your data worth something. Uh, if it's shared across many uh, companies, thanks to portability, you get, get incentive. And we just made one calculation. If you divide, so for Facebook, just an example, if you divide the revenue they make on, uh, on, on in the US, for example, per US user, right? And you divide by the number of US users. I don't think, don't talk about average. We, we can go into that, uh, right? It's approximately $300 per user per year. Would people will pay $300 you know, to use Facebook uh, uh, and not having their data uh, used. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't see that. The other thing we've seen is the market cap. When you check about okay. the market position. Yeah. Um, um, okay. We still have two minutes before we conclude. Um, well, well um, I, ha I have, I would say, um, a remark on your, you, you, you mentioned that anyway, the B2C uh, data has low value and it can be extrapolated, you know, with uh, data sets can be extrapolated with, uh, with AI, with similarity algorithm or whatever. So, I mean, if you data to, um, I would say you can extrapolate on a given set of um, data, may it take time or not, this I don't know. Um, we can see is that we say app development based on solid. Uh, what, what I hear from that is that um, as far as the perception of the value of a service that you get is higher than uh, the data that you free, I mean you feel you 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 feel right. I mean you feel confident. You feel right to free your data, and that's been the, the core business model for Google, Google, Facebook, or the big players. Okay, because they grant apps and services for free at least at the beginning, <laughs> uh, they ask you to free your data, opt-in. Uh, and it has been very, very successful. So I'm just wondering, and that's a personal comment before we switch to the conclusion, if uh, communities of um, data owners, personal or private data owners, would go together in a very structured way to market their data lakes for given, I would say, targets or objectives, would this bring equal value to the service to be developed thanks to such data lakes or not? 
So I'm just wondering, I have no, no clue and I haven't seen anything like this in the world so far. Maybe I'm mistaken. But, uh, you know, like kind of reverse auctions when you have clusters of people going together on the platform, putting their data and uh, in a such a way where the industry, whatever kind of industry we're talking about, say, wow, that data lake is worth and I'm, I'm, I'm willing to pay for that. I'm really willing to pay for it. So reverse, you know, reverse, reverse adoption. And here maybe there's room for, you know, uh, introduction or use of uh, data uh, portability um, and data portability and data privacy technologies within such canvas, which are driven by data pro personal data producers. So I'm talking about communities. That's a, that's a personal thought. Um, okay, it's uh, 16.31. We are just on time. Perfect. So it's time to conclude. Um, I will take just 30 seconds and then I will let you conclude uh, before we answer the, we enter the Q&A &A, uh, &A sessions for 10 minutes. Um, okay, on question one, you, uh, you said, okay, um, take to transfer, okay, but you know, it's about regulation, user experience, business incentives, open APIs. That's what you mentioned, roughly speaking. And question two about um, moving or converting small numbers into uh, massive numbers. You said, okay, public adoption, just to as a showcase. Um, start with the developers community um, and uh, with frictionless use of data portability tools and technologies. And uh, take a few examples, maybe or inspiration from the B2B uh, data marketplace or data spaces, which are now emerging from, from the market. Um, and then question three about uh, monetization, where you were all, you all agreed on the fact that it's not a good idea <laughs> as such, uh, at least for B2C, B2C data um, for many reasons. So I'd like to thank you for your, uh, for your answers. Um, and I, uh, I give you a floor to conclude in 20, 20 seconds each of you, uh, before we enter the Q&A session. Tom, right. you want to start yeah. as usual? Sure. <laughs> okay. I think data portability should be driven by... You are mute. Uh, you are mute. Ah, uh, still? Yeah. Be, uh, wow. I can't hear you. <laughs> I think data portability should be driven by organizations that today already have an incentive to enable this. And by that, I mean governments and public interest organizations. And in addition, I believe those organizations have to make sure they agree upon open standards. Uh, on my side, uh, um, I, I we just think uh, API neutrality should be imposed as a PSD2 regulation, for example, that ob enabling obliging company to give you the same API access as a user that they give to partners and they give to other applications. Like this, user will be able to re-own their data with no need of technology transfer, nothing, just APIs that developer will be able to use uh, in the same manner than others. Today, they give you really poor data files. If they give you full API access with an API neutrality mindset, uh, the problem will be uh, solved in most part. Okay. Right. So, um, yeah, we conclude that, you know, um, data for the a is a, Great idea, uh, but we should work as well on uh, making understand the companies. What are the consequences of losing the data that they value the most? Because as, as we said before in the discussion, companies make a lot of the money by the data that they keep. And if now they need to start moving it out, maybe we should provide them with solutions like uh, to retain information about the, the customers or users that are living still in a, in a way that is GDPR compliant. So not only working on making the data flow, but as well helping companies to mitigate the consequences of that. Yeah, so in order to enable more companies to adopt data portability. Okay, I don't, I don't know if you can hear me. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Yes, okay. So, um, so, so, Okay, so uh, who wants to take the lead for the questions from the audience? Because I can do it. And I let uh, our free guest to answer. So Anna or Antoine, I don't know. 
Hi, everyone. My name is but Julia Morabski. Uh, okay, so I'm working with... I will with... unlog and I will reload. Yes, thank you, Bertrand, for the uh, as being a moderator. So we have one question in the chat for Mehdi. Could you, hello, for Mehdi, could you please reiterate the notion of the sharing of data with respect to the value of this data? Um, I don't, I don't see exactly what, <laughs> what. Uh, Maybe Habib, can you uh, turn on your camera and your mic? So maybe, maybe what I was saying is that in the portability, you know, many, many companies give your data with really low value. They give you JSON, whatever, poor file. They claim this is the data you provided according to GDPR portability. Every time someone has tried to get to download their data, they have data that has no real value. And even a re New York researchers at the university showed that what you can do with developer uh, with the uh, Facebook data as a developer with GDPR portability, nothing. It's a really good paper. I will put the link. What developer can do with Facebook API, which is about your data, amazing billion dollar applications like Zynga and other applications that have been made like this. So unless we have direct APIs, right, and we rely on really poor data dumps uh, 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 from GDPR portability regulation, it's, it has no value. So do not hesitate to raise your hand if you want to speak to the panelists. Uh, we have one question from Pencholeni. Uh, what are the organization to target to start data portability? Is there an industry which could be a game changer, healthcare or mobility? Because there are public organization in most countries. Yeah, I think uh, I think a healthcare uh, could be uh, could be a game changer. Uh, but you know, um, when when we have talked to some healthcare companies, if the other ones were concerned about privacy, the healthcare industry is even um, uh, is even more concerned. But the benefits of healthcare data portability are super obvious. What they are, it's like you know, you move to different. Uh, you move from one one community to another one, then you can move all your data to uh, uh, to the new hospital where you are getting attention. So the, in the healthcare, the benefits are super obvious and super desirable for for living, um, but uh, they are the most scared about uh, moving data around. So we need to to deal with that. So it's a, it's a big brain, sorry, big gain, but a big uh, you know they are big afraid of that. Uh, definitely yeah i think another uh, interesting in industry that we are uh, getting a lot of use cases for is uh, ah. data sharing between governments and uh, financial uh, institutions uh, for example you could use your uh, government data uh, to to easily apply for a home loan uh, you could uh, use your income information to get a new life insurance product and so on so i think in that sector between those two sectors there's also uh, a huge uh, amount of use cases. Yeah, and uh, I would also add, you know, with a phone number portability that we all have now in Europe, thanks to uh, regulation. But at the time, you know, there were advertisements, everybody was aligned because it was a real use case. You were completely locked, locked in in a career unless you had to change your phone number. And now it's obvious for everybody, nobody would go into, in a career that would keep your phone number forever. So portability is, is massive as long as People are aware of this, and sometimes you are aware of stuff only when it happens. Before you are conscious, it can it can happen. You are not you, you you don't care, right? Because you th you think it's impossible. This is the exact same thing here. Transport data, whatever healthcare, it will be obvious when it will be implemented. But this is why I was talking about incentive and user driven regulation can help, but entrepreneurs too. They, we need these billion users applications, right? Where that will demonstrate portability. We're looking for this. Uh, regulation can help, but uh, yeah, these, these industries can be big enablers. Uh, I don't see uh, any hands or any questions. Choo, choo, choo. I would just comment on, you know, uh, the data union. 
just to say a lot of data union data cooperatives are there the, the data fund and others Criteo tried to gather all the e-commerce platforms to gather data against Amazon, right? They tried to make a data co-op. It's a, it's, a, it's a publicly traded company, Criteo, who do uh, retargeting and advertising. They stopped, but yeah, their initiatives to fight the big ones with the mass of the users. Yeah, just to answer Bertrand, come on. Perhaps, Julia, I can read uh, something in the chat from Timo from My Data Global. Uh, he uh, says, I hope that we are together able uh, to not only show the value of uh, data portability, but also influence now the upcoming EU Data Act, which is now open for the first uh, phase consultation. Um, he asked if uh, someone in the audience is working on it, and well, he shares the, the link. Uh, related to this information, so uh, it's interesting. I don't know if someone wants to comment something. I think we have the last question from uh, Poncho Lely. Uh, it will be a conclusion also. Um, any thought about the data portability governance? I'm not an expert on that subject, so uh, sorry, I have to pass. Yeah, I have to pass too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's so we've we've worked, we've read it, we, and everything. But let's say that as entrepreneur, of course, the legal environment is extremely important. But again, if they're sorry to repeat, if we don't have the tools to make it happen, the law is useless. Uh, and we, we, you know, a law without its possible application. Uh, you know, is, is completely useless, even whatever important regulation it is. So we are making the tools to be able for honest people to stay honest, as we say, and respect the law. Thank you, Mehdi. Um, so thank you, everyone, for this uh, roundtable. I will let the floor to my colleague, uh, Sarah. She will uh, wrap up the the afternoon and you can see yes on the chat timu uh yeah left a link to the data governance act if you want to go further and to know more about it so anna are you here i am thank you very much julia uh, thank you everybody for your um very insightful takes uh, in this two last panels. Uh, it was really great to hear uh, so many um, food, for thought, food for thought, I would say, and inspirations. Um, lots of topics recurring, like uh, I noted down a couple of them, like empower customers, data literacy, uh, informed choice, um, return or the, on data, and, and maybe last but not least, the um, role of the public sector to drive user insensitives. It was uh, really very interesting to have you, and especially that we had some technical problems uh, 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 <laughs> during the session. Apparently, we became uh, an object of interest for, from some trolls, uh, um, but still, we you managed to convey this great content, and uh, we are very thankful for that. So uh, thanks also for participating in the DAPSI project for the last months. It's, uh, it's been quite a journey and uh, it's getting to the end now. So uh, we are, of course, a little bit nostalgic to, to let you go, but also very, very happy to, to have spent with you uh, this, um, this time. And we wish you all the best. And uh, I don't know if Sarah would like to maybe add some words from, from the DAPSI. Uh, perspective as the coordinator of the program. Yeah, okay. Just to say that it was a very interesting day, in, of course, in the morning, but uh, for DAPSI also in the afternoon. And uh, now we know the results achieved uh, by our uh, teams under DAPSI program. Uh, they are finishing uh, with this uh, final event and few more details, I think they are finishing the, the participation in DAPSI, but I hope uh, we will uh, still be a community and we will still uh, uh, collaborate together in the future. So good luck for the coming steps and see you soon. 
Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, all the speakers. Thank you, uh, all my colleagues from uh, DAPSI uh, program that were backing us and also from Cap Digital. And very, very special thank you to Julia Moravsky that was uh, uh, behind the scenes and very big bravo for all the great work she put into setting it up together. And uh, by that time, I'm, I'm giving it back to Antoine to close the day. Thank you, thank you so much, Anna. Uh, <clears throat> I will uh, switch in French to conclude uh, the uh, the web after the platform global event. Um, um, so please do not hesitate to click off, uh, on the interpretation button uh, to have the translation. Uh, merci, merci, merci beaucoup, merci à tous. Uh, je suis pour ma part tellement heureux d'avoir pu avoir cette séquence d'APSI euh, au sein de notre, de notre événement euh, web après les, les plateformes. Quand j'y repense d'avoir à la fois Jean-François Bramatique d'un côté, qui est quand même l'un des pères du web, euh, jusqu'à euh, tous ces lauréats euh, de DAPSI, tous ces entrepreneurs pour se projeter dans les enjeux euh, de, de la portabilité des données euh, du web de demain, euh, c'est euh, absolument, euh, je trouve, parfait et, et ça, ça a montré la capacité qu'on a pu avoir à couvrir euh, l'intégralité de, de ces questions complexes euh, que sont celles de l'interopérabilité euh, et, et du, du partage euh, des, des données. Euh, donc voilà, on arrive déjà au, au terme euh, de cette journée qui a été si riche, euh, si, euh, si dense euh, en perspective euh, et, et en partage euh, que je n'ai pas grand chose d'autre à vous dire que, que merci et surtout je tenais aussi à remercier toutes celles et ceux qui ont rendu cet événement possible merci évidemment à tous nos intervenants à tous nos modérateurs merci je le répète à tous les lauréats du projet d'APSI euh, merci à, à toutes celles et ceux qui ont participé à l'organisation et je vais prendre le temps de les, de les nommer euh, Odile Chani, Françoise Colaitis, Bernard Soulès, DJ Carré, Daniel Handler, Benoît Mojan, Sylvain Lebon Denis Pensu, Franck Bonneau, Florian Forestier, Alice Poggioli, Maud Giovannetti, Margot Berrettoni, Virginie Giraud, Véronique aubertin bodin Charlène Salmon, Mathias Dufour, l'équipe d'APSI, merci encore à vous, Julia Morowski, Cap Digital d'APSI, Anna Badurska, Cap Digital d'APSI, Sarah Matteo, Miguel Gonzalves, Bertrand Lejeune, Michel De Jong et toute l'équipe d'APSI, j'en oublie sûrement. Merci également à, à Abdul Othman qui a géré toute la, la partie technique et la, et la chasse aux trolls euh, pendant cette, euh, cet après-midi. Euh, merci à lui pour, pour cet accompagnement. Et merci également à John Ritchie et, et Marc Lheureux euh, pour l'interprétation euh, proposée euh, pendant cette, cette journée qui a aussi permis à tout un chacun de, de suivre dans les meilleures conditions les échanges. Comme je vous le disais, ce matin, ce n'est pas fini. On ouvre avec ce premier événement, le web après les plateformes, une séquence, un cycle d'événements. Et on va vous proposer très prochainement des rendez-vous plutôt axés filières en forme d'atelier, un peu en guise d'ouverture à ce que disait Jean-François Penchelili à la fin avec sa dernière question. Quelles sont les filières prioritaires sur lesquelles on peut concrètement porter des projets avancés pour rendre le web plus interopérable Et on va d'ailleurs vous sonder, on va vous envoyer un sondage dans dans les jours qui viennent pour nous aider à déterminer sur quelle filière on, on, on vous propose des ateliers en, en priorité. Ça, c'est extrêmement important pour nous et on espère qu'on va pouvoir plugger des projets d'APSI au sein de ces, de ces échanges et continuer à les, à les valoriser. Voilà ce que je pouvez vous dire, il ne me reste qu'à réinviter sur scène euh, tous euh, les, euh, les porteurs de projets d'APSI, l'équipe d'APSI. So guys, could you please turn on your camera? I would like to take a, a picture, a screenshot with everybody to, uh, to have a team picture to conclude this, uh, this uh, amazing day. Um, Abdul, si tu peux nous mettre en, en gallery version to have all the... Uh, Uh, the participant or the speaker and then uh, make a screenshot or, or something i don't know exactly which, <laughs> what is the best way to do but uh, is that okay for you abdul can you hear me okay Up. I made a screenshot. Julia, if you can do the same, just to be sure. I'm trying to do it as well. Oh, thank you, Anna. 
And it's just another one. Do not hesitate to, to smile. One, two, three, screenshot. Thank you, thank you so much, everybody. And I think it's okay. We can conclude this uh, this day. Take care. See you very soon. And thanks again to everybody and everyone. Bye bye. Thank you, Antoine. Have a great Merci. Afternoon. Merci. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.